There's the old adage that says, treat them mean, keep them keen. Mm. And so <laughs> why does that manipulative tactic actually work? Why is it that men can ghost us and then it actually encourages us to try harder? So it, it starts with people seeking out validation. And it's a pride thing. It, it eats away at their pride when you reject them or when you ignore them. You don't give them what they were hoping for. And now to feel better about themselves, they go on this pursuit to gain that validation, gain that attention. But the crazy thing is for many people, once they get it, they'll go back to realizing you just missed the attention. You miss how it made you feel. You know, or in some instances where the person is being treated mean, I think a lot of that also just speaks to the unresolved trauma in a lot of people's lives and how it triggers them in certain ways when people do mistreat them. But again, I think we have to not confuse the fact that it's not simply the mistreatment that keeps them around. It's the high level of desire they have for you despite the mistreatment. Because to say how it is, if an unattractive person met you and treated you bad, you wouldn't automatically be like, oh, I want them now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we can't just go around treating people like trash and that's going to make them want us. No, it's the fact that they already wanted that individual. Now, despite being mistreated, it creates this attachment in the situation for a lot of people. But I will say that there's a lot of advice to men that tell them you treat the woman poorly and you're going to be in a better position with her. You know, it's like they say, uh, treat her like a celebrity and she'll treat you like a fan. All right, it's one of the sayings they have out there. And so it's this idea that if you if you give her too much attention, if you show her too much love, respect all these different things, if you put her on too high of a pedestal, she will essentially start to look down upon you. And now she ends up going to the guy who's not doing all those things. So there is a lot of taught practices that say, no, you have to ignore her. You have to do throw a little mistreatment in there. You, you have to be this certain kind of way. Now, for a woman to differentiate whether it's a tactic or not, I'll say this. The person who's genuinely ghosting you just ghosts you and that's it. The guy who's using it as a tactic, he may still throw out some feelers to try to see if you'll stick around, all right? So women have to consider, okay, how was this man treating me before this action? If he was treating you poorly before he ghosted you, for example, um, then there's reason to believe that this is either him just losing interest or it's a tactic. If he was treating you amazingly well, then he ghosts you. Again, it's tricky because it can still be a tactic or it could just be he backed away because he felt like you weren't showing interest. Because for what a lot of women don't realize is they get so caught up in trying to evaluate the man's actions they forget the role they play in building a relationship. So essentially, they meet this man, they want, they have this mindset of, he needs to prove to me that I can give him my time and my energy. And she has this kind of wait and see approach. But in doing that, she's not expressing desire. She's not showing him that she's serious about him. And in today's world where so much more men have been hurt before, have been played, are carrying their own trauma, they're gonna be sensitive to the fact that you're not reciprocating the effort. So you'll hear these stories of women saying, yeah, this man treated me so great, he was perfect, and then gone, done. And, and to her, it's, oh, he was just playing a game this whole time because he was trying to manipulate me. No, he was genuine, but he didn't see anything coming from you. So he figured, let me get out of here before you end up hurting me or someone else came along who was reciprocating his interests. Oh God, this makes so much sense. Okay, so let's even go a little deeper then. Um, how do you then prevent getting manipulated in those moments and um, build the validation? Because you actually started, right, where there's yeah. like it's a validation thing. How do you start building the validation within yourself so that you're not seeking it from ex somebody external so that when somebody comes along that actually is treating you well, it isn't filling a hole that's missing? Okay, so let's start with building the validation. So for me, you know, I'm a man of God. So I believe for anyone who's a believer, then going to God and, and strengthening that foundation, that relationship is what's going to help you have that validity that you don't need from other individuals, okay? But I think even if you're not a believer, it's about understanding everyone's not for you. Everyone's not going to be a fit, all right? It doesn't matter who you are. Even the most amazing, beautiful, successful people are disliked by others. 
we have to understand that's the that's just life. It's just the way it is. So the minute that someone doesn't like you, you don't need validation from them. You know, there's this unfortunate reality where you see it with celebrities or influencers all the time. They could have millions of followers, post something and get thousands of positive, loving, supportive comments. But let there be one negative comment and they're focused on the negative person, okay? And they get caught up in now concerning themselves with this individual or the people who don't like them, who don't support them, and forget, but you had all these other people who do. So for a lot of individuals, it goes back to shifting the mindset to remember those who love you. And of course, making sure you love yourself and not getting so caught up in those who don't and, and, mm -hmm. and don't pour into you in those ways because they're not built for that. They're not wired to see your value, to embrace it, to honor it. Just let them go and move on. So I think that when we're trying to create that validation within ourselves, we need to heal because for a lot of people, the seeking of validation stemmed from something they were missing probably in their childhood. All right. They didn't receive that love and validation from their parents. They didn't see that receive that love and validation early in their life. And now they become adults seeking it in the wrong places, which then leads them to, you know, attaching themselves to individuals who don't truly love them. Because you have in some situations where you're seeking it from someone that resembles the person who didn't give it to you in the first place. All right. So I had one client one time where her father was very emotionally distant, emotionally detached. And so she found herself getting with men who were the same way and trying to gain that love and validation from them because it was attached to the issue she had unresolved from her father. So for her, we had to go through the process of flushing that out of your system, addressing those things, healing, forgiving, all that goes along with the healing process for her to finally break that negative cycle. Yeah, God. And so doing that work allows you to break the cycle so that if you get into a relationship with someone and they end up manipulating through ghosting or any other tactic, you're not then chasing. Because I have heard you said, and I actually agree, like um, being thirsty isn't attractive. <laughs> uh -huh. So talk to me about making sure that you're not thirsty. And then for anyone at home that may not understand what that is, if you can break that down. Okay. So for those who don't understand what being thirsty is, it's you can say it's over pursuit. It, it's showing desperation, all right, in trying to obtain someone, because we're speaking in the context of relationships, mm -hmm. trying to get their attention, trying to win them over, trying to gain a relationship from them, whatever the case may be. Now, I do think a lot of women, they, they're, they're so concerned with being thirsty, they, they have dry mouth, so to speak. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, they're not doing anything mm. to show interest and desire. It's, no, no, you have to come after me. And it's like, no, again, relationships are built on two people giving a mutual effort and both doing their part to make it something special. So you can't just say it's all on him. But as you mentioned, we don't want you chasing. We don't want you being thirsty. Now, to differentiate those two things, I think where women have to, and just people in general, because I say the same thing to men, you want to make sure you've presented your interests clearly. I think that's that's the least people can do, all right? So it's not about constantly calling them. It's not about going you know, overboard in your actions and trying to gain their attention. But do they even know how you genuinely feel, all right? Let's start there. And I think there's this assumption of, like if a woman meets a man and she goes on a date with him, to her it's, well, I must be interested I'm on this date with you. No, because men have been on thousands of dates with women who were just using them in the moment. All right, who never really saw anything potential. And, and guess what? The same thing happens to a lot of women because a woman could start talking to a man, but for all she knows, all he ever wanted was sex. All he ever wanted was a good time. He wasn't serious. So both parties have a reason to be cautious and to, to question, are you genuinely interested in me? So the more we can be clear about that, the better we have a, an opportunity to see if we have something here. And here's what's, what's interesting I think women overlook. If you are clear about your interests and your desire for, let's say, a real relationship, you will actually scare off a lot of the men who just want sex. Because in today's mm -hmm. world, a lot of men, especially now, see, once upon a time, I think there was more of an inclination for men to 
play the game, so to speak, because they figured, okay, well, if I don't act like I want a relationship with this woman, I have no chance of getting any action from anyone, right? But the world has gotten a lot more sexually free, so to speak. Um, it's a lot easier in the sense of women being willing to engage despite not being in a relationship, despite not being married, all of that. And we're not discussing whether that's right or wrong. It's just the reality of the world today. So a lot of men who are just pursuing women for sexual reasons, they have less reason to try to deal with navigating through someone who wants more when they can go to someone who accepts less. Plain and mm -hmm. simple. So by you simply being forthcoming about, hey, I like you, because I'm telling you, there's a lot of men, if they only want something casual and you say, I really like you, they're like, oh, I'm out. <laughs> this, this, yeah, because they know it's going to be a problem. Don't they, though, and I'm going to play devil's advocate, but wouldn't they see the opportunity to go, oh, they like me, see, I can get them into bed? Y yes and no. The, the problem is, again, when you you expressing you really like them and you want something serious, the fear now, and don't get me wrong, there's going to be some men who are going to view that as, yes, all right, this is my way in, I can get her. But then there's a lot of other men who view this as, all right, this is going to come with a lot of emotions attached. This is going to come with unnecessary drama, things I don't want to deal with. And again, I think it boils down more to if he's the man who even has options, if he's a desirable man, I think he's less willing in most cases to move forward when she's expressing those kind of desires, all right? If he's a man who typically does not have many options, doesn't have many opportunities, then yeah, he's like, I can't run away from this just because she likes me. I gotta move forward because again, where am I gonna have this opportunity again? So I think that's what differentiates for a lot of guys whether they'll move forward or not. But yeah, a lot of men don't want that pressure of she really wants something real and I know for a fact I'm not here for that. You know, which is why you'll see examples of the man who wants something casual, he doesn't want to get into deep emotional conversations with you, all right? Because again, this creates a level of attachment, a emotional burden, so to speak, and it requires parts of him that he is not prepared to give you and doesn't desire to give you. So the more you are standing in your truth as a woman about what you desire and what you want, Again, it doesn't guarantee it scares away every man who's not serious, but it's going to weed them out a lot easier than holding back. And I'll say this, at the very least, it's much more effective than playing along and not standing in your truth. Because now when you're vague, he can assume you're on the same page as me. He can assume, oh, you, you know what this is. You just want to have some fun too, so we're good. So there's no reason for him to run away from it. Mm. And so in saying that, you're taking the assumption away and you're giving them the opportunity to either say, oh, yes, I actually am also interested or, oh, no, sorry, I actually just wanted a fling and clearly you're not ready or you're not the right person. Exactly. Because I think, I think women view men as these evil people who just want to take advantage all the time. But in reality, most men have a level of conscience that says, you know, I don't want to just blatantly use and take advantage of this woman when I know she so deeply wants more. You know, again, we hear the horror stories, but they don't represent the majority of men. Now, we could argue they might, they might represent a higher percentage of very desirable men. That's a fair argument. But I just think that a lot of men in the face of that woman being honest about what she wants, and him knowing that he doesn't want the same, it's, it's just harder. It's mm -hmm. a lot harder to continuously move forward. But again, it's not just stopping there for the woman. You have to pay attention to, all right, is he showing up in this process as a man who wants something serious? Are you guys spending time? Is there conversation? Is there more to this than just, hey, are you free today? Let's hang out. Or, hey, let me come over. You know, is there more to it than that? If not, there's reason to believe that he just wants to have fun. Mm, yeah. And I've also heard you say that if um, if a guy is looking for something serious, you pretty much know it from almost day one. For the most part, I think mm. so, yes. I think, again, the, the pursuit of a man who just wants sex is typically going to look a little bit different from the man who wants a relationship. Because the man who just wants to have fun or something casual, he wants the most for the least. Basically, mm -hmm. whatever least amount of effort I have to give here to still get what I want, that's the goal. Whereas the guy who is serious about you, he's like he's prepared to pour in in all the different ways. And, and I think 
That's why it's so important for women to not only stand in their truth about what they want as far as the seriousness of the relationship, but what you need as far as how he shows up in this relationship. Because the guy who's serious about you, if, for example, let's say a lot of women complain about men texting too much in today's world, where it's not enough phone conversation or in-person uh, conversation. And I've, I've heard some women, I know of women who cut men off because of that, because their mindset is, well, he's a grown man, he should know better. And I always say, no, you can't assume that, especially in today's world where he may have dated women before you who loved texting, who preferred texting as a method of communication. So he's not going to just know that that's an issue for you. But in you expressing that issue, now you're going to see where he really stands. Because if you let a man know how you feel and he dismisses you, makes excuses or does not correct the action, but continues to pursue you, that's not a man trying to be serious with you. But if he's always making the corrections, hearing you out, discussing the issues, there's much more reason to believe this guy is serious. Mm. And I assume also, though, that what he's texting would make a difference. Like if he's texting, hey, you free for dinner tonight? I'd love to take you out. Versus, hey, you free tonight? I'll come over and I'll bring the bottle of wine and the candles. So I want to say yes and no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Only because... I, so here's another issue, and this kind of goes left a little bit. One of the things I'm finding that is creating a big disconnect in dating and relationships is... We're not understanding that people communicate differently through mm. different methods, mm -hmm. all right? So online dating is a big thing. And a lot of women will complain about these men having no conversation ability on online dating. But I say to them, I say, listen, I'm someone that can have a conversation with anyone. But I'm horrible if you try to talk to me on any platform, social media, online, because I don't like all this small talk. I don't like this condensed version of me having to type. It doesn't allow me to just be free and speak. So how I'm going to come across online and in person can be very different. I think the same thing applies to even text. There are some people who do texting. They may be very uh, short with their answers, with the way they speak. There's no depth, but that doesn't really define how they are in person. And I think, unfortunately, we live in this world that has gotten so into unnatural ways of communication. And I say unnatural because once upon a time, none of this existed. You could only talk to a person face to face. Even phones, like phones at one time seem so normal and natural and they're cool, but they don't tell the full story. We need more in-person conversation. So back to your point of what he texts, to a certain degree, yes. But I do think this is where we have to look at the overall picture. Because if he talks like this in text, but when in person, he has more depth to conversation, he's more willing to go deeper into these different topics and address issues, then I'm willing to give him a pass on how he's texting you, you know? But if he's consistently short like that, and consistently maybe let's say all he ever wants to talk about is sex, then yeah, mm -hmm. clearly he's not being serious. Yeah. Um, I love that breakdown. But also, um, text seems to be a great way to breadcrumb people. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's like um, they ghost you for a while and then they'll just shoot you a text thinking of you. Yeah. And so that makes you think, right? Because there is that moment almost of like adrenaline rush when you look at your phone and you see that person's name mm -hmm. that they've texted you. Um, so talk to me about that and breadcrumbing and how, um, as we're talking about like these kind of manipulated tactics that we sadly sometimes fall for, um, how powerful is the breadcrumbing tactic through text? So there's a lot of situations that it's not, the intention wasn't to manipulate. So what I'm thinking about now is, for example, two people talk, man and woman, they dating, things seem to be going okay, but they kind of fall off. Maybe because again, the woman was like waiting for him to do more and step up. The man feels like maybe she's not really showing me how interested that she is. So he kind of falls off, right? And then what happens is, unfortunately, let's say he's on social media one day and she posts something to her story and she's looking so good in her story right now. And he's thinking, dang, maybe, maybe I should try again, mm. right? And, but again, it's not because I wanted to manipulate her or whatever. He thought it wasn't really working out. He figured, let me just back off. It doesn't seem to be going anywhere. And then he has this renewed desire to try again because he sees her online or some other somebody brings her up in conversation or he's just thinking about her and like, man, maybe, 
Maybe I should give it a try. Or maybe he talked to a friend and was like, man, maybe you gave up too soon. Hit her up again. And the thing is, because we're, we can be very scary, people in general, texting is this very like light way of trying to reach out and check the temperature. <laughs> All right, well, let me just see if she responds to this and, and then we'll kind of go from there. So I do think that sometimes we have to be mindful. It's not always with malicious intent, right? But for the man who is a manipulator and, and is trying to uh, string you along, it is a very powerful tool, you know? And it, it, it is, does allow them to breadcrumb and drag things out a lot longer than they need to. And that's why for women, I think what's important, no matter whether he's the genuine guy or the manipulator, start with how do you genuinely feel about this man, all right? Because if there's no genuine interest or you know deep inside, he's not the right guy for me, right? Through the fact that you guys don't fit, maybe the values aren't the same, whatever the case may be, then just ignore it. I don't care if he's genuine or not. If you know he's not the guy for you, don't engage with this man. On the flip side, and I think some people aren't gonna like hearing this, but they need to hear this. What up, homie? I've got something free and new to share with you right now. How often are you visited by that negative voice in your head telling you that you're not smart enough, that you're not good enough, experienced enough, not fill in the blank? One of the most powerful things you can learn to do in life is to turn that negative voice into your bestie. And I wanna teach you how to do that and so much more in my four steps to becoming confidence workshop. And guys, the most amazing thing is you can actually register for completely free for this workshop. So click the link on your screen and I'll see you on the inside. There are some women who try to basically let go of a man who is good for them, who might be best for them. But there was something that went wrong. Maybe it was a misunderstanding. Maybe it was just bad timing. Whatever the case may be, and a lot of people have this mentality of, well, no, an ex should always remain an ex. And it's like, not necessarily. We got to go deeper to understand what, what was the reason why things ended. Is there a good enough reason to possibly rekindle? Has the issue been resolved? So if they're reaching back out to you and genuinely you feel like, for example, there is a real connection with this man, but for whatever reason, things didn't work out the first time. You don't have to be so quick to dismiss the possibility of at least you yourself checking the temperature and seeing, okay, well, where's his head at? Have things changed? Are we in a better place to where we could move forward, okay? There's gonna be some situations, not all, but there's gonna be some um, uh, scenarios that this will apply to and there's nothing wrong with seeing how things can progress. Mm. And then how, so how do you decipher the difference between those two then? Well, again, I, I think it starts with one, what are your genuine feelings for this man? I, I think a lot of women, unfortunately, have fell in the trap of the fantasy of the man, not the reality of the man, all right? And, and not even just the fantasy of the man, the fantasy of the situation. So mm -hmm. their attachment to that person or that relationship was due to what they thought it could be, what they hoped it could be. If he could just fix this, if this could just change, you know, it, it's all this projecting, but not facing what is the reality here, okay? So if as a woman, you step back and you remove all the hope and dreams and you focus on, no, what is it? What's really going on here? Do we really have a good fit here? Do we have good communication? You know, how do I really feel when I'm with him? There's a lot of women, if they really thought about it, they don't even feel at peace when they're around the guy, okay? Because they can't be themselves, right? They, they, maybe he's overly judgmental, um, or they know there's something deep inside. Their intuition has always told them he wasn't the guy, but for various reasons, she tried to believe this could work, okay? And, and that attachment may have grown simply by you invested so much time and energy trying to reach the fantasy that now, you want to see the fruition of your work. You want to see a return on your investment and you will keep trying until you do, even though it just digs you a deeper and deeper hole. So as a woman, when you can be honest with yourself about why was I even there and why would I want to go back, all right? Now, when we start to understand if it's genuine or not, then we can get to level two of, okay, if, it, if we now realize this really wasn't the right place and this wasn't for the right reasons, okay, we know we need to leave it alone. But if we go deeper and we say, wait a minute, no, there was a connection. There were all these amazing things, but maybe again, we had a huge misunderstanding. Maybe the timing was bad. 
Um, so for example, some people aren't gonna like this, but man, it's hitting my spirit, so I gotta say it. You have some people who met when one or the other was separated from marriage. And you know, I'm I'm a big believer in you, you don't wanna date someone who is still married, separated or not, because things can go left at any moment. I've seen so many situations of people dating someone who they thought, okay, they're gonna leave their partner. And then in the fourth quarter, it's like, hey, you know what? We decided we're gonna work things out mm. again. We're gonna get this another try. And now they're devastated and crushed. So I do believe you wanna wait, but let's say for example, you met this person during the separation time. Clearly the time isn't right. You break free from it. Now, someone might say to this person, well, this can't possibly be your husband if there's someone else's husband. But if the divorce actually happens and now they're available and they're free, why, like, why would you not revisit this if there was something there? And just because they were married does not mean something special wasn't there because the unfortunate reality is that a lot of people are married to the wrong person. You know, the, I, I think some people don't like the idea that this married individual, man or woman, could have genuine feelings for someone else, even stronger feelings than they do for their actual husband or wife. But the reality of life is this happens. This happens a lot, okay? Because again, you know, once upon a time, people only got married because they got each other pregnant, mm -hmm. all right? Not because they truly loved each other, not because they were truly on the same page. Family pressure, societal pressure, all right? You have some people who got married because they felt like their clock was ticking and this was the best available option and they just figured, all right, let me just move, move forward with this. But again, there wasn't genuine connection and deep feelings. So it's almost expected that at some point they might meet someone else that they have real feelings for, all right? And it, it, it's a very you know tricky situation. But again, I'm not saying to pursue it while they're still married. But I am saying it's an example of right person, wrong time, where they needed to come out of their situation before you two can now move forward and actually come together. Oh, God, that was so strong. And uh, thank you. I always love it how honest and transparent <laughs> you are, even if people don't necessarily yeah. like to hear it. Um, I'm always looking for the truth. Mm -hmm. um, I think because I was trying to project why would that be so then? that if you were dating someone that they said, hey, look, we're separated. And to your point, like if they're then finally divorced, why wouldn't you get back together? I think you start to replay what they said, were they like, and then potentially question, were they actually honest? Was it just a reason to get me into bed while they mm -hmm. were still married? Now I'm the other piece. I definitely don't want to be the other, you know, the, the side piece. And so it's the, almost the protection mechanism to them be like, this person has this memory, and so I'm better to push them away than to assess what happened and then potentially revisit. Some people have worked so hard to detach from that person ah. that now that they they feel like they finally did it, and now this person comes back in their mm. life, and they're like, I don't, I don't want to go through this again. I don't want to go through the potential because what if this doesn't work out? What, what if they, I'm wrong? What, what if they're not as serious as I think they are? What if this is just a rebound for them? There's so many questions and doubts that can now play in your head because you're looking for reasons to validate not going back into the, the fire, so to speak, okay? And, and I think that that fear is what has caused a lot of people to not reconsider situations that actually may be best for them, okay? As well as it could be also if, for example, you were dating this person while they were separated and you had all these friends and family telling you, you're stupid, what's wrong with you? You know, blah, 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 putting all these negative things in your head. And now that you're, you're you know, they're divorced and you've moved on or whatever, you don't want to deal with their, the outside noise. Uh, and all the people, how they're going to look at you because you went back to this guy. Because to them, it might be like, well, he dated you when he was still technically married. He's clearly not a good man, right? Mm -hmm. Or what if, what if he did not tell her every detail of the situation? So for example, okay, they were separated, but he didn't tell the woman they were still living in the same house. Oh right? yeah, that, that's done. I'm, I'm moving see, on. There's no freaking way. <laughs> okay. Now, here's the thing though. And, and I am not in any way validating a lie. Sure. But I, I want to say this. I do think everyone, before they're so quick to demonize people who tell a lie. <laughs> I <am> just now. <laughs> I'm like, fuck that dude. <laughs> the thing is, I always say, I say this at my events. Has anyone ever not told any kind of lie in their relationship? Of course. Exactly. So 
Is it far-fetched to say, wait a minute, it's not that this guy is this horrible, evil guy. Is that he was afraid that when he met you, if he gave you those details, he wouldn't even have the opportunity. Doesn't make it okay, doesn't make it acceptable, but it also doesn't mean he's this horrible man that you should never reconsider if things change. You see? But we hold on to the hurt of that, maybe that one lie or whatever it was, and again, we use that as fuel to say, don't go back, don't go back, don't go back, but we're not looking at the overall picture. You know, because on the flip side, the guy who's not for you, the guy, the relationship that was not meant for you to even entertain, it's not just one thing to point to. It's tons of things you can point to. All right. So to me, it's the overall picture that will tell you or at least give you some insight as to is this something to reconsider or is this someone who just never belonged in my life? So I definitely hear the point you're trying to make. Like we are very quick to make assumptions, to dismiss, uh, label people, right? Mm -hmm. Good, bad, toxic, great guy, you know, things like that. Um, and there's so much nuance to that. And I think yes. that's obviously what you're saying. But the thing for me is like when it's such a big lie, like living with somebody while you're still married, that you're so right. Like as I'm saying it out loud, because it's like if they were sleeping in different rooms, if they had both agreed on it, if she knew he was dating, then the story does change a little. It, it, it I, I, was like, I was like going to push back on you. I'm like, actually, you've got a point. <laughs> exactly. The details matter. The mm. details matter. And again, it's just a matter of, listen, we, we all, I give you a perfect example. There's a woman who just came to me at the event and she said, uh, she's widowed, right? And she said, well, how soon should I tell a man that I'm widowed? And I said, well, you don't have to announce it, but if, if questions about your previous relationship comes up, just be honest. And she said, well, I just, this guy just recently asked me, um, do I still have a relationship with my child's father? And I said, yes. Mind you, the child's father has mm -hmm. passed away, right? Now, is this an evil woman because she lied to him? It, it, did she do this with malicious intent? No. She was afraid because she felt that every time she told someone she was a widow, it created this problem in, in the relationship or they felt uncomfortable about things. So in her fear, she, she did the wrong thing. Now, I told her, I said, listen, you should go back to him and let him know that and just tell him, listen, I, I lied. This is the reason why. All right. So granted, if she does take those actions, that will that's a little bit better. But just as we just gave the example with the guy who's being separated, we're humans. We make mistakes. In moments, we get scared. And in that fear, sometimes we tell a lie or we don't give the whole truth. Again, I don't want anyone to think I am validating lies. And I'm not saying it's okay. I am saying we have to be mindful of not, again, trying to paint this person as this horrible individual or not capable of being in a healthy relationship because they made that mistake. You know, again, what is the overall picture? Because if he's really a bad guy, he's a bad guy in more ways than one. Bad men, toxic, truly toxic men, don't, don't just do this one little thing wrong and everything else amazing. That's not usually the case. They do multiple things. They may be multiple little things, they may be multiple th big things, but there's usually multiple areas that they're not showing up properly, okay? Same thing, if someone's a bad friend, they're usually a bad friend in multiple little ways or multiple big ways, but it's not just one little small thing, but they're amazing in every other way. So look at the overall picture because if they are amazing in so many other ways, then to me, that's more reason to believe this one little issue is fixable. Yeah, because I think we very often, not just women, but men, we just we have a story in our head about what that means, right? When mm. someone does X, Y, and Z, this is what it means. And I think that that's so much of that comes from our own background, our own traumas, our own experiences. But I do understand like there's that weird dynamic between asking somebody, okay, well, maybe instead of me judging you, maybe I need to hear you out. Yeah. I think the fear, right. to your point earlier, about if someone's been hurt, if someone's like finally done all the work to let this person go, in hearing someone out, it gives you the opportunity to be susceptible. Susceptible doesn't mm -hmm. mean they're going to manipulate you or use certain tactics, but it becomes more susceptible now for them to lie again and then maybe trick you or yeah. you feel tricked. And now you've kind of got this like um, continuous loop where you're not able to break free. So sometimes when you've built the strength, it's easier to walk away than to be open to the discussion of why X, Y, and Z happened in the first place. Yes, and so I think that goes to we haven't strengthened ourselves to be able to trust our ability to navigate that situation. 
hearing them out doesn't make them good for you, all right? But understanding what's going on, where they stand, and then seeing are we in alignment or not, then I can determine if we can proceed or not. If I am still struggling with being able to handle conversations like that without letting the wrong person back in, that means there are things within me I have not healed and resolved. Plain and simple. Because once you are healed, you see everything so much clearer. And I, and I have to say this because there are some people listening to this who will say, well, no one is ever truly healed. That's nonsense. Everyone can heal. It is possible to truly, fully heal. Now, granted, there will always be new experiences in life that can create a new hurt or a new trauma. However, what I have seen is that once we resolve those deeper traumas, especially those childhood traumas, right? Once we face them, resolve them, flush, and we heal from that, nothing hurts us the same like it used to. Because in healing, we, we create this new mindset and perspective of things. So for example, part of healing is understanding a lot of what people do is due to their own issues within themselves they haven't resolved. So it's the whole hurt people will hurt people, okay? And when you understand that on a deeper level, you internalize less because you don't take things as personal anymore because you know this action is reflective of their deeper issues, not of me, so to speak, right? So now when the next person does something, you don't take it as personal like you did those other times before you healed. So now it doesn't linger as long because now you know the, the, the method in which to flush things out of your system. You're more aware of not suppressing and holding things in. So you may always have new battles to face, but you are so much stronger in being able to navigate them and handle them. So I do think that people have to understand you can fully heal. Most people just have not, have not fully healed because they haven't fully resolved. And so you'll have people say, well, I've been to therapy for years and, and I've done X amount of work and I don't want to ever dismiss the efforts they made. I, I applaud them. That's awesome. But a lot of people have taken certain actions and they learned how to cope and manage, not how to resolve and fully heal, Ooh. okay? And so what happens is, and even if you flush some of it out, you still have things lingering, which is why now you get in this new relationship and something happens and you're triggered. Triggers are signs of things still lingering within you. They aren't just, oh, this is who we are, this is what happens. No, that means something's still there. You should not still be getting triggered. So you have to go deeper. And that's the part people don't like because they feel like, well, I already did all this work. Okay, but you got more to do, you know? And if you really want to get to that place of being at a greater level of peace and, and going back to what we were talking about, not having the fear of falling for the wrong people anymore and falling back into negative cycles, you've got to go all the way in to resolve those past issues and fully heal. Mm. And do you think then the fear is a sign that you haven't done that work yet? Yes. Or completely? Absolutely. When people ask me, well, how do you know you have healed? One of the first things I say is when you are willing to be fully open and vulnerable to love, you've healed. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people, they want love, but they don't want to be fully vulnerable to it. They want to put a piece of their heart. They don't want to put their whole heart on the table. All right. They're still in this very protective, defensive mode. You can't experience the fullness of it if you don't let it all out and, and allow your heart to be fully exposed. And people may say, well, but then you can get hurt. Yes. But if you understand how to handle things, that hurt is not, it's almost like it go before hurt for you, before you get healed, getting hurt is like re-breaking your arm over and over and over again. Once you heal once and you're not open, Getting hurt is like getting scratched. Mm -hmm. Like, it's going to go away. It'll be fine. Or maybe a bruise to the arm. But you're going to be fine. And you know you'll be fine. If you survived all the other experiences, why won't you survive this one? You're still here. You're good. But now you're going to be doing it with a better mindset, a better understanding, a better level of awareness. You have nothing to worry about. But if you keep holding back, you're robbing yourself of the chance to experience the fullness of love. That's why I always say the same walls you have up to protect you are the same walls blocking your blessings. All right? You can't live this life in fear. And, and going back to people who are believers, you either live in fear or you live in faith. You got to choose one. You can't keep doing both. That's so true. I've also heard you say when it comes, to, like as we're talking about matters of the heart, mm -hmm. we will put rules in place to potentially protect us from ever getting hurt again. Yeah. But I've heard you say that 
we often will put up rules, but more for the people that we don't like. <laughs> <laughs> so talk to me about that and then how we actually start to um, not just dictate it based on how we feel about someone, but more about our integrity and how we actually want to show up every day um, and more have concrete boundaries than just rules depending on how we're feeling. Yes. So as far as we, we have make rules for the people we don't like, we're, we're always going to be more flexible the more we like somebody. So it's almost like, all right, you can have a woman and a guy tries to talk to her and she's not really that interested, but she figures, okay, I'll give him a chance, right? So with that guy, the type of restaurant or place he takes on that first date, she's going to be more scrutinized, all right? How he how he shows up, every little thing, because you were already having to convince yourself to even give him a chance. So you're almost looking for, is he going to prove me uh, right or make this worth my while? Or is he going to show me that this was never worth my time and I should have never given him an opportunity? Now let's flip it. She meets a guy that she from the jump is like, oh my gosh, I really like this guy. Man, she doesn't care if y'all went out for coffee. <laughs> she doesn't care if you took a walk in the park because she's just happy to finally be able to engage with this man and have an opportunity for something more to come. So she's much more flexible and, and men do it too. Everybody is much more flexible with people they really like or even people they're very attracted to, all right? It's just this natural human nature thing that occurs. I think what's important for people to understand is before you start creating rules, you have to make sure that this is this person in alignment with my values and desires. Because I think that sometimes we're trying to put rules on people who may not fit your life and it's only going to blow up in your face later. So what I mean by that is this. Let's say I'm a man and I want a woman who like you have a lot of men nowadays that talk about they don't want a woman that goes out all the time. Right. They want a woman who's more just at home, chill, doesn't have to, you know, be out there in the streets, so to speak. Right. <laughs> and so if he meets a woman that he really likes and now he enforces this rule on her, but deep inside, she's a woman that likes to be out. She likes to go dancing. She likes to just, you know, see and, and explore and all these different things. And you'll have this woman who will try to accommodate this man's rules, but then go against her true desire. And it might work at first, but at some point it creates a conflict. And so now here's what will happen. And this happens in so many marriages. In that conflict, it's going to come out in different ways. It will either be her not being happy with herself, right? Because she felt like she's lost herself. She doesn't know who she is anymore. That can lead to her depression. So now that negative energy starts to pour over into the relationship. All right? And she's dimmed her light for somebody else. Exactly. Or it may come out in resentment towards him, all right? Because in her mind, I am not allowed to be myself. I'm not allowed to do the things that I like. And it's your fault that I can't, all right? She's shifting it on to him, even though she has to embrace the responsibility she had in accepting that choice. But that's how it may come out, all right? And either way, whichever way it comes out, it starts to deteriorate the relationship. All right. This is why I feel the need to mention this. Like I, I, I've heard of some men who will talk about being with a woman that they can essentially mold. And you can even hear this from some women. And I always tell people, you can't, you should not be trying to date people you need to mold. Now, I want to be clear. Molding is, is one thing if molding is we're learning how to love each other, how to pour into each other. And it doesn't go against who we truly are as individuals. But if molding is changing your character mm. and making you into something you are not you are not, this is a recipe for disaster, all right? And what happens is you'll have these relationships where they're built on making this person something that they're not. And once that true self tries to come out, because you can only suppress the true self for so long, it blows everything up. And the other partner who did the uh, in placing the rules or placing the molding is like, well, you don't appreciate me or look at this. And it's like, no, but you're not seeing the deeper issue. They are in conflict with self and they are not happy. And that unhappiness is going to wreak all kinds of havoc. So I, to go back to the question about rules, I just think we have to be careful. First, discover who this person is as, as themselves. What, what kind of rules do they have for themselves? And are those rules for themselves in alignment with who you are and what you believe? Now, yes, we can discuss other rules and, and more so, I think, other standards. It's less about rules, mm -hmm. but more so about standards that we want to set. And we have to be honest about 
Do we want to live up to those standards? And I think it's so important for women to not fall into the trap of, I really like this guy, so let me try to be what he likes. Because if it's not who you truly are, it's not going to work in the long run. Yeah, God, that was so eloquently put. And it was just reminding me of my relationship with my husband that, mm. yeah, like day one, I was so enamored by his personality and his character. That All the rules I had about the restaurant he was going to take me to, the car mm. he was driving, <laughs> all that went right out the window. Yep. And he took me to like a B restaurant, which for anyone that's not in America, restaurants get rated A's or B's and then C's, they shut you down. So B's look basically as bad as it can possibly get. <laughs> and on the first day, Tom took me to a B restaurant. Mm -hmm. And I think actually it allowed me to see him for him yeah. versus the things that he came with like a nice car, a nice restaurant, paying for dinner and all those sorts of things. Um, and I like that you said standards because I think that's super important. How do you start to evaluate somebody's standards then, especially as you're starting to date? Because you're not just going to ask, I mean, maybe you do just ask what their standards are, <laughs> but how do you start to evaluate to see whether your standards do align? So I do think we need to ask. I think that's the problem. We're not asking enough questions. And I think one of the great ways to evaluate standards is to create scenarios and say, how do you, how would you handle this? Mm -hmm. You know, like I remember one time I, I was talking to someone and I said, okay, if we're at a club, if we're at two different clubs, right? And someone comes to dance with me, what, is that inappropriate to you? What, what would be your issue? Or they come to dance with you. How would you handle that? Mm -hmm. Let's understand. So it's not even just understanding what the standard is. What do we find inappropriate? You know, what is acceptable? How would we prefer our partners to handle things? Because if they would say, well, in that moment, you need to just walk away or act rudely. And, and so for someone like me, for example, if I'm out in the street and someone comes up to me, there's a lot of people that stop me. The actual me. street, not the... Yeah, the actual street. Because <laughs> I walk to the gym all the time, okay? <laughs> so when I'm walking to the gym a lot, people are stopping me, people are recognizing me, they want to take a picture. Now, imagine if I had a, a partner who says, no, if any woman comes to you, you need a rejector. I can't live that up to that standard. Because of who I am, the brand, I, I pride myself on always being positive, welcoming, loving. If you want a picture, I'm going to do that. You know, if you want me to be rude and, 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 and stand offish, I can't accommodate that. So we have to accept we wouldn't work well together, you see? And we can't find that out unless we talk about it, unless we ask certain questions. So I think there's this idea of just always going with the flow and just, you know, you'll figure it out as you go along. No, ask, ask. And I think so many people, when they say, well, you don't really know someone, like you can be with someone for years, you don't really know them. No, you don't know them because you didn't talk about things. You, didn't, you don't know them because you're not asking the deeper questions that need to be asked. So yes, I think that's how we establish what are each other's standards. And I do think, listen, some things are going to be flexible. Some people may, you might provide a new perspective that makes you say, or that makes them say, hey, okay, you know what? I see your point. All right. I think I could do it that way. You know? So that's why we have to discuss it and not just assume, well, because they already have this set standard and it's not in alignment with mine, it's automatically we're done. No. Once the standards have been expressed, now let's discuss them. Let's go a little bit deeper. And if we see there is no common ground, there is no, okay, adjustment to getting on the same page, now we just understand this isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. And how deep do you go, though? Because to your point, I love the, the club analogy mm -hmm. because it's so specific. But there's so many little scenarios where you're not actually saying the words and over time it does build resentment. So I, again, I love that you said about the club, but how, how do you start to dig? Like, what are those questions that we can start to ask the, our partners or people that we're considering dating to know if we do align? Because some people will just stop at, okay, if you're at a club and someone offers to buy you a drink, what do you do? But mm -hmm. it's very different if someone stands next to you, offers to buy you a drink, you say no, and then they just start talking to you and then they ask if you want to join them at their VIP booth, right? So like, do you know what I mean? Like, there's yeah. so many nuances. So how do you start to actually refine that discussion without feeling like you're potentially crossing a line of somebody else's beliefs? So I think, to your point, there's so many different little small details and nuances. And I think it would be unfair for us to expect that we cover every possible different I'm gonna scenario. I'm going to you for eight hours. Yeah. What do you mean, Stephon? <laughs> We're going to go through every single scenario. Yeah. Because the chances of, of us being able to even remember all these different things sure, would be difficult. Yeah. I do think, though, we start with the foundation. 
you know, and we focus on that. And with that, we then give each other grace to learn and adjust mm. as new different scenarios and details arise. We do have to use a level of awareness in the sense of, for example, if my partner says to me, well, I don't want you dancing on some woman in the club, right? Then I think it'll probably be safe to say that me then go hanging out in the section full of women, <laughs> right, with them, is probably not mm. something that she wants mm. either. Now, in fairness, yes, could it still be something that we can have a discussion about later? Granted, but I do think we we can draw some conclusions based on the foundational principles of where we set our standards and how we want things to be handled and what we consider inappropriate or not. So I think just start with what are the common occurrences. Start with things that you know do happen to you. If you're a woman and you go out to grocery shopping often and you're constantly being approached, well then that's an easy scenario to paint and, and ask, okay, well, how would you feel if somebody approaches me in the grocery store? How? What would you think is an appropriate way for me to handle it, you know? That's how we can just start from there and then just build as life throws off new scenarios and new situations we need to learn how to navigate. Yeah, that's super fair. I really wanted to go down every detail. <laughs> but you're right. It's going to be take a long time. Um, you said something earlier that I'd really love to touch on. So you said um, not everybody is married or with the person that they actually should be or, or they want to be. Yeah. Ooh, that was very heavy hitting. And... In your examples that you gave, I actually can really see that. So what do you do? Almost like, let's take both sides of it. As, okay. as a person who's maybe with somebody where you're like, you're settled, you've had the same, you know, like, you're okay. It's not like you're unhappy. Mm -hmm. they, they treat you well. They're a good, you know, partner. Maybe they're a good parent to your kids. Um, and then you meet somebody else and the attraction is there. How do you just discuss that with your partner? Should you discuss that with your partner? <laughs> Or what do you do about it? That's tough. Um, so I, I it's hard for me to say you should go discuss it with your partner simply because you have to be prepared at that point of this, this negative seed you're about to plant by having that discussion. Now, if it's simply you met someone and you, you were very attracted to them, but you're going to cut this off and handle it. I don't think it needs to go any further than that, all right? Because you recognize it from the jump, you're handling it, okay. And you don't see that as cheating in any way? Well, cheating to me is going to depend on the partners involved because various people have different perspectives of what cheating is. Mm. There are women who feel that a man looking at porn is cheating, all right? Mm. There are some people who are going to feel like any kind of talking, flirting, engaging with someone too long is cheating. Like, people have different, you know, views on it. So I do think this is another one of those things that have to be discussed early on as far as what is your, your line of what cheating is. And, I, and again, I think not just cheating. I, I think people have to focus more on what do you consider inappropriate. Yeah, that's a better because way of saying Because sometimes we get caught up in the semantics of whether, well, that's not cheating. I didn't do this. And it's OK, but it was inappropriate. You know I don't appreciate that. You know that I find that as a problem. So you shouldn't be engaging in that behavior. That's, we just leave it at that. But going back to the situation, if you know you're in a marriage or in a relationship that you're not really happy, with, or you said they're doing okay, but you know it is what it is. It's okay. They know they settled, but they're doing fine. And you meet this other person you have this strong attraction to. The problem is, I think what happens to a lot of people in that moment is it makes it even harder for them to appreciate their marriage. So mm -hmm. what I mean is, it's very easy to stay in a settled place when you don't feel like better even exists, all right? The minute you get a taste of better, it changes everything. So now, the little annoying things your partner did that you were willing to look past become magnified because now you've experienced this person who you, if you have this connection, because I, because I also want to say, I, I don't think it should just be based off of you have an attraction to this mm. other individual because you're going to find plenty of people you're attracted to. But if you meet this other person you have this connection with, like I had a client one time, she was married for, I don't know, 15 years. And her whole story was like, she knew she wasn't supposed to marry the, the man she married. She knew it wasn't there with him, but she kind of just fell into it. It's a whole long story. But anyway, she met this other man who she felt the connection that she never felt in her life. And it completely like, 
turn her life upside down. Because again, now her ability to show up in her marriage was severely impacted because what was lacking there became so much clearer now. It's easy to be in denial of, we don't have great communication when you never experience better communication. It's easy to be in denial of, the sex isn't that great, until you've had amazing sex elsewhere. Now, hopefully in these situations, they're not crossing that line, but in reality, it happens. It happens. And that just flips everything upside down. So at that point, we could say have a conversation, but you you better be prepared that that conversation may lead to the end of that comfortable or settled marriage that you've been holding on to. And I think at that point, a lot of people aren't going to be willing to have that conversation because even though they're experiencing now this amazing feeling with this new person, it doesn't automatically mean they want to risk leaving what they've been comfortable and conditioned with for all these years. And But then I always say, listen, if, if you are experiencing that with someone new, I'm I'm willing to bet if we examined your marriage, there were things going wrong all these years. Like it, it wasn't as okay as you made it seem like. And again, as someone who's a coach who's seen behind closed doors of a lot of people's relationships, I'll tell you one time, I remember one time there was a woman on social media, all these pictures of her and her husband. I love him. This boom, 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 boom. The whole time it was the most toxic Abuse, not not physically abusive, verbally abusive though, which is still horrible. Just it was just a horrible situation. But you would never think that based off what was being presented social media wise. And they did eventually get divorced. All right. And so a lot of people put up a facade, but you don't know how severe uh, the the relationship really is behind closed doors. And so it just makes this conversation very tricky because I think. We'd have to go deeper into the details of what's going on in that marriage, right? This is why I'm so adamant about trying to get people to avoid even being in that position. This is why I push connection so much. This is why I push healing so much, because I know it's the lack of understanding and awareness of those things and the lack of healing that exists that leads to more and more mismatched relationships and marriages. Mm -hmm. I love that. But one question I have is, do you think that you can have connection with somebody even if you're in a great relationship? Somebody else? Yeah, because again, how are we defining great? Let's say you're, you are very content. You absolutely love them. The sex is amazing. They're romantic. They give you the thing they need, but you still have a connection with somebody else. Yeah, because I, I think, again, a lot of people, I hate to use this word, but it's just reality. A lot of people live in delusion and they they're not giving you the full scope of what's going on in that relationship that they claim is a great relationship. Again, I I remember one time I had a client and she was talking about a man that she was like, you know, I love him and, and, you know, we're having issues. He was in jail when they started the relationship. He gets out and she's like, ever since he's been out, you know, he's not home. He's doing this. He's doing that. And I'm like, okay, explain to me why you love this man, right? And when she started to go down the list, it was everything that she does for him, nothing Mm -hmm. that he does for her. But yet to the world, it's I love him, I love him, I'm so deeply into him. No, you're attached and you're afraid to walk away. And you thought that by pouring into him while he was in jail, that you were securing his love. You thought you were earning it and that now he would hold you with so much value because you were there for him. But you did that out of your own defense mechanism. You thought it'd be safer to give to this man who needed you so much than to be vulnerable to a man who you'd had to compliment, not hold up and and, and basically be his crutch, so to speak. And so once you start to really dig deeper into a lot of people's situations, it's just not what it seems and it's not what they proclaim for it to be. But even if it is great in the sense of all these wonderful things, that doesn't define connection. Connection is so much deeper than that. And and that's why it's tricky because, listen, I'm not going to sit here and say there's never been a successful marriage that didn't have that deep connection, right? But when people don't have it, it is a very likely thing that that relationship is not going to last. And when I've seen the majority of relationships that did last 50, 60 years till death do us part, they had connection. And, and not just last, because it's one thing to last mm-hmm. in misery. It's another thing to last happily, okay? 
and those who have lasted happily all have deeper connections. Yeah, God, I a thousand percent agree with that. And that's one thing that a lot of people talk about now is like, oh, well, they've been married for X, Y, and Z. It's like, yeah, but are they actually happy? Yeah. Or have they just like <laughs> succumbed to their destiny? You know, like, yes. well, I guess this is it. Um, and the reason why I asked about the connection thing is being I've been married now for 21 years. Mm -hmm. And I've always thought about this of, of course, my husband's going to have connections with other people. Like I just, to think that, out of seven point, was it seven billion people in the world mm -hmm. that he's only going to ever have attraction and connection with me? I think that almost it would have set me up for um, disaster because I think that there are other guys that I have connections with, but I don't fall in love with them. I don't act on it and I don't think of them as being part of my future. I just think, oh, this so they're really kind and, I and I'm a kind person. So we've connected over this. And the, I find it empowering to think like that. And in the sense of, will never act on it, first of all, and like I said. And just because you have a connection with someone doesn't mean that you want to spend the rest of your life with them. And that's the other thing. Like, I've really, I want to spend the rest of my life with my husband. And I, he's choose, chosen me and I've chosen him. But I think that there might be some fear to some people that if they have a spark or a connection with somebody else, that it means that their relationship is broken or that they have to change something. The hard part about discussions like this is that a lot of words are used differently mm -hmm. by different people. Mm -hmm. So, because there are people who will make that argument. Well, you can have connections with a lot of people. But when I think of connection, I'm thinking of this very rare occurrence that does not happen ah. with a bunch of different people. So I'm thinking of different words to use. And I'm thinking, okay, maybe what she's saying is bonding. Yes. Maybe maybe it's chemistry. Maybe Because I do feel that we can have chemistry with tons mm. of people, all right? Mm. I think we can bond over similar interests and things of that nature with tons of people. I don't think the connection that I'm referring to is something that happens with a bunch of different right. people. It's very rare. And I think it's even, it's very unlikely to be in a relationship with connection and to experience that elsewhere. Because once you have a connection with someone, you are so emotionally invested and so emotionally, whether it be bonded, connected, whatever, it's hard for anyone to come in there and actually match that level. Like the bar is set so high in a connection that other people coming behind and matching or beating that bar is just unlikely. So I think it's tricky because, again, there's probably people that are agreeing exactly what you're saying. And I don't want people to think that. That's why I was trying to also make sure people don't think just by having an attraction with someone else, that means something's wrong with your marriage. Right. Like, definitely not. And, and I think this is where someone has to be very honest with themselves. Because it's one thing if you can say to me, I genuinely feel a connection with my partner, with my husband, right? And then I met someone and I feel like I have a strong connection with them. Let's just say I, I missed that part. I, maybe the, it, it exists and I don't know about it, right? But at least if you know you have that connection with your husband, I think you're good. But the majority of people know they don't have that with their partner. Not only do they know they don't have a connection, they know deep inside this was always not supposed to be. They know deep inside this was not the right man for them. Again, a lot of women's intuition, spirit, told them from day one, this is not it, but they moved forward anyway. So this is where you have to be very honest with yourself. And this is why a situation like this is very tricky because the outside world cannot verify what you know deep inside, all right? I, I can only give you some level of guidance and, and, and things to consider. But only you know the truth deep inside. It's the same reason why for those who are believers, I always tell people, I will never argue with someone who says, God told me X, Y, Z. Because I can't verify that or not. I don't know if you truly went deep within spiritually and heard that answer in prayer. Now, I can question, how did you come to that conclusion? And Because I'll, I'll find situations where people say, well, God told me so and so. And then when I ask them questions, no, it's that you saw certain signs and you assumed that that was God telling you something, right? Whereas when I speak on God telling you something, I'm talking about going in prayer, asking a question, and hearing that answer in your spirit. Those are two very different experiences, all right? Now, if you say to me, I did that part, I prayed, I heard the answer from my spirit, and this was the answer, I'm not going to fight with you because that's I can't verify that or not. And I'm just going to have to trust. That's between you and God. So it's the same thing when it comes to what you really have going on in your relationship or in your marriage, only you can answer that truth. 
And you have to be willing to be honest with yourself about what's going on. Are you holding on to something that isn't best for you or no? Is it just that maybe, because some situations may be that you're at a moment where you and your husband are going through a disconnect, right? And you meet someone who's filling that void. And you have to be very careful to now assume that just because they're filling the current void, that that means you should be with them and not your husband, okay? And part of how you determine that is, did you ever have that void filled by your husband before? See, it's very different, for example, if you and your husband have had amazing communication, always been able to talk to each other. But let's say he's at a time right now where he found a new job or something's going on in his career and he's become less available to you, okay? And now this new guy comes in and he's filling in that spot. And now you're finding yourself drawn to him. You got to take a step back. Your husband is fully capable. He's shown you that. It's just that right now he's going through this rough time of trying to accomplish things. You have to be aware enough to say, no, you know what? Let me shut that door and let me go talk to my husband and figure out how. That's where we have a discussion. That's where it's like, okay, listen. And it's not even about I'm feeling this way about someone. It's I feel like I don't have this connection with you anymore. I, we, we're not talking the way that we used to. I know you're working, but how can we make time to at least balance this out better? Okay? That's very different, though, from you married a man who never talked to you, who you never had this with, all right? And you, you've you been trying to just roll with it for years and years and years, and now here comes this man that you are having this amazing connection with, amazing communication, and something that you've never felt with your, your husband. Now we got a problem. Mm -hmm. now, now this is a symptom of you have been in the wrong relationship this entire time. Oh, I love how you just broke that down. And I'm always loving, uh, I love like these types of discussions because it makes me think in a different way. And you're right, it all comes down to how do you interpret the word connection, uh, connection thank you, um, in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the, um, you said chemistry. So yeah. I think that that's actually in my head somewhat intertwined a little. Mm. Um, and yeah, I mean, look, me and my husband are very honest about, you. I don't expect you to only find me attractive. Yeah. Like, babe, I'm one in, you know, <laughs> exactly. four billion people in the world. Um, I think it's more romantic that you can find other women attractive and yet you still choose to spend your life with me mm -hmm. than saying, no, 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 I don't find anyone else attractive. Now, I think that that also came with my own, going back to something you said pretty much at the beginning of this interview, it went to my own, how do I validate myself? Mm -hmm. How do I make sure that I feel good about myself so that I can say that? Because if I didn't have, have built my confidence up, which I've been working on for like the last 10 years, if this was, you know, early days and I was very insecure, I don't think I could have said that. Mm -hmm. I think in thinking that my husband would find somebody else attractive or potentially having a chemistry with somebody else, would have triggered me. I would have been very, um, I think, jealous, I think is the right word to say. I would have been very insecure. And I think I would act it out of accordance to who I want to be in types of discussions where I think I would have um, really put my walls up and um, not actually hear him anymore. Um, and so thank you for actually breaking down that that kind yes. of the, the conversation. Because again, if me and you can basically be doing this and talking about, oh, well, what do you actually mean by that word? Now imagine how many couples aren't aligned with their discussions and think they're saying the same thing, but actually aren't saying the same thing at all. Exactly, exactly. And that's why I, I used the word earlier about misunderstandings. Mm -hmm. So many relationships, whether it be marriage, boyfriend, girlfriend, they end due to a misunderstanding, not an actual disconnect. All right. Mm -hmm. and, and it's, again, using words differently or perceiving the use of those words differently. And people aren't digging deeper enough to understand, well, what did you mean by that? Like so many women will email me saying, well, my man said this. What does he mean? And my mind, I'm like, why didn't you ask him? Yeah. Like, wh why are you asking me to interpret it? Because I can give you various scenarios because you have to understand from my from my position, I see things from so many different angles because I have dealt with so many different people, so many different situations, so many different relationships. So if you ask me a question like that, I can give you the possibilities of what this means. But ultimately, you've got to go back to that man and say, hey, what, did, what does this mean to you? 
What are you trying to convey to me? Give me more words to understand this. And that's a part that we miss a lot in relationships and, and people rather make an assumption or they go off of their friends and family's interpretation of what he meant. And if it isn't what she liked, she's done, she's gone. And it was like, that's not even what he meant. So what, what, did there, anyone, has anyone ever given the answer of why they will come to you and ask versus asking them? No, they don't, they don't really give me an answer, but I know it's because they're scared. They're scared that the clarity that will, he will provide is going to be what they don't want to hear. Mm -hmm. Okay? And they also, and it could be also fear of, well, I don't want to come across like I'm being too pushy trying to get him to explain. You know, women already feel kind of antsy about having discussions with men because they feel like so many men shut down or they're going to run away. So again, they suppress how they really feel. It's like the whole question of where do we stand? right? Women are terrified of asking that question because they've, they've heard all these things. Well, you shouldn't ask a man, don't pressure him, all these things. But by you not asking and suppressing, you now are not at peace. And, and here's the crazy part that people overlook so often. And this is why I really push women to always stay true to how you feel, express yourself. It's not about what you say, it's about how you say it. So find the effective way to express yourself, but you must do it because what up, homie? I've got something free and new to share with you right now. How often are you visited by that negative voice in your head telling you that you're not smart enough, that you're not good enough, experienced enough, not fill in the blank? One of the most powerful things you can learn to do in life is to turn that negative voice into your bestie. And I want to teach you how to do that and so much more in my four steps to becoming confidence workshop. And guys, the most amazing thing is you can actually register for completely free for this workshop. So click the link on your screen and I'll see you on the inside. So let's say, for example, uh, a woman's with a man for a year. She wants to get married, but she's afraid about bringing up the marriage discussion or asking why haven't we got married. So now in her suppressing it, she starts to be unsettled in the relationship. She starts to have an attitude sometimes. And he don't know what the hell's going on. Like, why is she so mad at me today, right? It starts to wreak havoc, and, it, and it's worse havoc because he doesn't know where it's coming from, all right? Which is even more frustrating when I don't understand why are you mad at me? Why is this a problem? Why are we having this disconnect, right? Which only feeds his desire to not marry you. So you're only working against yourself because now you're giving him reasons to say, I can't trust marrying this woman. She'd be mad at me for all kinds of reasons. I don't know what's going on, right? I'm confusing this relationship. I like her. I love her because I see all these good things. But there's this lingering thing that I don't understand, which you're causing by suppressing yourself. Mm -hmm. So be clear because if he's not serious about marrying you, you need to find out. We can't be afraid to face whatever the truth is, even if it's an unwanted truth, all right? And we are not doing ourselves any favors, letting, letting things linger on. So I think women just have to really get out of their head, whether it be in the dating phase of asking questions they need to ask, or in deep in the relationship phase, or even in marriage. The lack of communication is one of the biggest reasons why relationships fall apart. And again, it's not just not talking, it's not understanding each other and not asking for deeper clarity and going further into questions when we don't understand fully what they mean. If you had to walk away saying, I don't know what they meant by that, the conversation should not have ended. You need to go right back. And if not right back, you need to say, hey, can we continue? Because there are some things I'm not completely clear about that I need more clarity on. And if you can't have those types of conversations, then that's your sign that you're in the wrong relationship. That's what I was going to say, because some guys, not to kind of, you know, poor guys, but, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, they're not very good at communicating. Yeah. And then often they'll say what you th they think you want to hear versus actually what they mean. Mm -hmm. So, OK, you know, I have the book, He's Lying, Sis. Mm -hmm. And one of the chapters, I talk about the reasons why men lie. And I explain to women that, listen, and again, I want the women to understand this is not in any way saying it's okay for men to lie or the responsibility is on her if he lies. However, everyone's goal should be, how can I create a better relationship for us and even for myself, okay? And so for women, I say, you have to set the stage of letting him know that he can be real with you without you getting offended, attacking him, taking things the wrong way. The sooner you can establish that and then stick to it, 
the more you will have that man open up to you. Granted, there are some men who don't want to open up because they just, they have their own issues they need to resolve. Which, if that's the case, he's not ready for a real relationship. Mm. So even if he's just a genuine loving guy who has some problems he needs to fix, well then let him go fix it. But that's another example of maybe he's right guy, wrong time. Maybe he has not evolved and developed enough to be in a healthy relationship with you, but that doesn't mean he's a bad guy. It doesn't mean he's the wrong person to be with. It means it's not time for that, right? Now, if it's a scenario where he's being closed off because he's not trying to go there with you, he's not looking to be serious, he wants something casual, but then again, that just means don't be with him. And unless he's willing to change those things, you don't need to proceed any further. But for a lot of men, the struggle is he doesn't trust you enough to open up and tell you everything he's feeling. Men have to worry about the woman throwing it back in their face. And for any woman who questions that, Ask yourself why, and this, is, this, is, this won't apply to every woman, but tons of women don't tell their female friends everything for the same exact reason. There are tons of women who will leave certain details out because they don't trust other women to not either tell someone else or use it against them if, anything, if any fallout happens between them. So if you have those concerns with women, why are you questioning a man's concerns in that regard? No one wants to have those things used against them. If you can show him you are capable of doing that, you will strengthen his ability to open up to you. So you do have to recognize the role that you play in creating that environment for your specific... It's not, it's, not, it's not the role you play for men in general. You know? You're not responsible for... But for your relationship and your situation, are you establishing a safe space to have these deeper discussions and conversations? And if you're doing your part, and he still won't step up and, and engage, let him go. Oh, there's so many good things there. It's because the vulnerability part is so important, especially when you're arguing and when you're hurt by them. So let's say you're in the middle of an argument, they've said something that's hurt you in that moment. Do you use that vulnerability that they shared with you against, uh, exactly. against them? Yes or no? And that was one of the rules that me and my husband have is you never use each other's vulnerability. And so in the worst moment where I'm like, I can't believe he said that to me, you know, um, like let's say he's just said something and I'm like, oh my God, that really hurt my feelings. Oh, never, ever, 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 Stefan, ever, ever, ever use something that he's told me as an, in the middle of an argument to shut him down. Exactly. Because I know I can. I know his wounds. He mm -hmm. knows my wounds. I know his triggers. He knows my triggers. And so I think that being able to share those is what brings you together. But then in those moments where it's easy for them to use it as a weapon, do they yes or no? Or do you yes or no? Exactly. Um, and so I love that. And there's one more thing that you said that I'd love to go to with um, if you want to marry a guy and you don't necessarily want to bring it up because you don't necessarily want to pressure them. Um, more and more these days, women are proposing to men. <laughs> I literally like, I haven't even finished like my question <laughs> your face. well why didn't you go ahead Stefan and tell me what you think I don't like it I don't like it at all and I want to be very specific um, you know there'll be people who will say well what's wrong with that why can't a woman show that man that he, she loves him just as much and be able to propose to him one let's again be honest about what typically is going on so one, let me say, there's exceptions to every rule. And there are some scenarios, and I'll lay out one of them, that I thought it was completely acceptable or understandable, right? But in the vast majority of situations where the woman proposes to the man is because she either feels like he won't or he hasn't, all right? And she has to take matters into her own hands. And if that is the case, then that means you are overlooking a deeper issue in this relationship. Something is not being addressed. Now, there will be people who say, well, the man can still say no. Yes, he can. But here's an unfortunate reality. Men have a harder time rejecting women than women rejecting men. The reason being is that we are not accustomed to being in that position as much as a woman is. A woman goes through her lifetime having to shake off men in public, men trying to date her. She's had many more opportunities to practice telling someone no, okay? so And I'm not saying no woman has ever been afraid to say no or said yes to a proposal even though that she didn't want to, but it's easier in general for women to say, no, I don't want to do this. For men, being proposed to number one is extremely rare. Even having women approach us and want to give us their number or something, that's rare. Like these are things that the average man doesn't go through 
So he does not know how to handle it as well. I've had men tell me the only reason I got married is because I was afraid to say no. All right? So I, I think in most cases, we're overlooking the deeper issue that exists that led to him not doing it himself. Because if a man loves a woman and wants to marry her, he doesn't have a thought process of, nah, I think she should do it first. <laughs> 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 That's not what he's thinking. He's thinking, yo, I can't wait to give her this <laughs> honor. Wait for her to get down on one knee. <laughs> exactly. That's not because no because sense. the average man understands how special it makes a woman feel for the man that she loves to propose to her. And he wants to provide that if that's her desire and that's something that he's down with. So if he's really cool with marrying you, he has no problem proposing to you. If he's not doing it, something's off. Something's off. So I think people have to not look at it from the standpoint of, well, it's an equality thing. No, no, mm. no. I'm always looking at, let's go past the surface. Why is this even happening? Now, we can sit there and say, well, it's unfair because it's been a, a gender role that's been you know enforced upon us that the man has to propose to the woman. I get it, right? That's a fair argument to a certain extent. But the fact is, due to where we are in life and society, when someone's going against that norm, it usually signals something else is going on here that we're not discussing. That's just what it is. It's the same thing when you have a man who, I always say, if a man has money and is capable of providing, but he won't provide for a woman, he's not in love with her. Doesn't matter if she even has some money on her own. If he's unwilling to do it, because again, even if we say, well, that's just based off of a gender role that's been a force upon us, the fact is we've gotten to a point where men understand how women view this in general. And when he loves you, the last thing he's going to want to do is go against that and make you question anything about his intentions. You see, if he's willing to do that, it's because he doesn't care in most cases. Or he's been traumatized and hurt by some other woman, so he feels like, well, no, I'm holding on to my money because I'm not going to get played like I got played the last time, which would then lead me to say, well, are you even with a woman you're truly in love with? Because if you're afraid to get played, the approach of people who are afraid to get played or, and who haven't healed is to get with someone who's not capable of hurting you as bad as the last person. Which means I have to get with someone I'm not deeply in love with. I just like them enough to be with. So there's already a disconnect there. So you see, I, my brain always works in, we got to go deeper because the deeper is going to tell us what's going on. So going back to the women proposing, I, I'm just not an advocate of it. But to give you that example of where I thought it was like, okay, this makes sense. There was a woman who, she was with her guy for a few years. He actually proposed multiple times. And she declined, but she only declined because of cultural differences in the family and how the family felt about the man. Not because he was a bad man, simply because he came from a different culture. And then she had an accident. He was there for her the whole time. And afterwards, she just realized, like, I love this man. And he's the one, like, everything was amazing. I'm not going to let my family dictate this any longer. And then she decided to propose to him. And to me, it's like, okay, that's different. Like, he, he did it first, though. This wasn't a man who wasn't doing it. He did it. It's just that because of, you know, her way of handling things at first, she kept declining. So now her coming back and doing it for him, I was like, OK, I see nothing wrong with that whatsoever. So much to say. <laughs> um, thank you for that example at the end. That was very powerful. I definitely have come from the like, if a woman wants to propose, hell yeah. Right. Like I'm such a female empowerment. Like mm -hmm. hey, we, if the man can do it, we can too. Yeah. But I'm also even with saying that, I also love to know the truth. And I love to know, to your point, when you go deeper, what does that underlying thing actually mean? And what is that perception? And then what is that doing to the couple in the long term? Uh, not, not to cut you no, off, please. but I, I'm so happy you said the long term. So here's the other thing that doesn't get considered. When the woman has to propose to the man, what happens in many situations like that is in the back of her head, she has to always wonder if I didn't do this, would he even be married to me? Mm -hmm. All right. And that creates a level of insecurity about the relationship, all right? Now, again, it's different if it's a scenario where, because again, exceptions to every rule. There may be a scenario where these two people were madly in love and in her excitement, she's like, I want to propose to him. I, maybe she always thought that would be cute and she thought that would be like an overexpression of her love. And so in that scenario, I think it's different because she genuinely felt like we love each other and I'm just taking the action, right? 
But again, in most scenarios, it's no. You knew he was dragging his feet or you were worried that he would not pull this trigger. So you finally did it. So now you're going to always question, why is he even really here? Now, if he goes on to be this amazing husband, that might take care of that. But what happens is the, when he starts to slack off or he's not showing up the way that he needs to, you now have to battle the, the current issue of what he's not doing and the fear and concern that he never wanted to be here. And a lot of people, when they say, I'm okay with proposing or I'm okay with a 50-50 relationship or I'm okay with all these things, they're speaking in the now moment, right? So yes, at this moment, you're cool with that idea. But what does this mean over the long run? How are you going to feel about this? And also, what stage is it setting? To go back to the woman proposing, here's another issue that concerns me about it. Because now, in many cases, it shows that you as the woman have to be the one taking initiative to make things happen here. Now, again, if, you, if that's just who you are, because I do believe there are some women who are very driven, they're, they're very like uh, achievers, they want to do things. So taking initiative, being assertive, is, it makes them happy. They're not, it doesn't bother them, it doesn't feel like a burden, right? But there's a lot of women who are only being, being like that in the moment out of necessity, right? And it's not really who they are or what makes them happy. So now, if you end up being the one setting the stage of taking the initiative in the relationship, well, guess what? He will always view it as, well, she'll take care of it. She'll handle it. Because it won't stop at just proposing. Again, it's never just one little thing. There's other ways that he doesn't show up in that same regard. And so now, you constantly carrying that burden of being the one that's assertive and taking initiative, how happy will you be? How much will you respect this man? Okay, and do you really want him to think it's okay for him to always wait for you to do things? That's the thing you have to. We have to be willing to discuss all of that. And and, and let's flip it because someone will say, well, let's just say he he is doing all those things, but she still decided to propose to him. Chances are that's not what it is. <laughs> Chances are he he's not being uh not taking initiative and being assertive in other aspects of the relationship. And so now all you've done is added another layer of taking the responsibility away from him so he does not learn how to grow up in that way. Oh, that's so powerful. I really struggled with this as an independent woman and feeling like, yeah, I'm, I can take care of myself, but also actually wanting a husband that takes care of things. <laughs> and so we just had to have that honest conversation of like, actually, babe, I don't mind booking a restaurant. Like, mm -hmm. I'll take the initiative because he's so busy. He he literally will be starving and then be like, oh, crap, I have to eat, right? Yeah. So that's his personality. I know that, but I like going out for dinner. So I take his personality for it as it is. I don't try and change him. Mm -hmm. And then I say, okay, how do I get meals out? How do I get, like, date night <laughs> out and about? Okay, I'll book it. I don't mind doing that. But you know what, babe? When the bill comes, I hand it to him. Even though we share the same bank account, <laughs> Stefan. So, and I've told him that. I was like, I like to be very independent and strong-willed and, you know, I'm very confident in that. But also I have zero problem in saying, babe, I like you to handle the check. Even when we go to sh shopping, if I'm buying something, I'll, I'll give it to him and he goes up to the counter and pays for it. But it's because we've been together for so long and because I have built my confidence. And I think that that's a massive thing of I've built my confidence and I'm able to articulate my needs to my partner without feeling guilty. Because I think that just speaking for a woman, a lot of us women do feel guilty if we speak our needs yeah. and we say them out loud. It's like, oh, I don't want to be too needy. I don't want to be judged. I don't want to be a burden. I don't want to be a bother. But going to basically everything you've been saying in this uh, interview is that if you can honor yourself, be honest, be transparent, say the things that you really want and then see how they respond, that becomes the most powerful tool that you have to not succumb to really taking it full circle to any manipulation that maybe somebody's trying to have on you. Absolutely. And, and you know, it's funny because I always tell people how I'm a payer, not a planner. Mm. <laughs> That's so I, I, good. So I love your, that. Your example is exactly what I like. <laughs> it's like, listen, you book it. Here's the credit card. Knock it out. I'm not good. I'm like Tom. I'm, I'm busy doing stuff. I don't want to have to worry about all those little small details. And, it, and what's funny also is that when you're already not a planner, and you're trying to plan for a woman, she wants you to plan the way that she likes it to be planned. Mm -hmm. So if you don't plan it to her liking, it's still gonna be a problem. So it's like, listen, let's skip all that. You take care of it, I'll pay for it. But to your point, and what we've been saying all show is, it's not about trying to accommodate or be what someone likes. It's about being who you are and seeing who likes that, who's in alignment with that. 
not being afraid to express your needs because in expressing them, you will see who can pour into them. Plain and simple, we're, we're doing ourselves a disservice by not being truthful about who we are, what we need. And if you don't know who you are, you don't know who, what you need, that's the work you should be doing right now, figuring that out. But even in that, I think a lot of discovering ourselves is a matter of accepting ourselves. We know what we don't like and what we like. We just refuse to accept it a lot of times. And we make ourselves think there's something wrong with us if we like these things. Like I, one small example, I went through a period where I'm very like high achiever. I'm always trying to do stuff. And so I tend to never be satisfied in a lot of ways because I'm always on to the next thing. And so, you know, people would tell me, oh, you need to stop that. You need to just celebrate things and all this stuff, right? So I said, okay, for a month, I'm going to not focus on trying to do anything new or achieve more. I'm just going to be okay with things are and just stay settled there. And it was one of my most depressing months ever, you know? And I realized after that, stop fighting who I am. I'm like this for a reason. The key is, yes, create proper balance. Don't get so consumed by it that now I, like, I, I, I do need to learn to not be um, stressed out by it, so to speak. But I don't need to fight who I am. And now that I can accept that part of me, now I can present that part of me to a woman and say, hey, this is who I am. Are you cool with this? Like genuinely. Because there's going to be some women, some women don't like a man being so, they like the idea of an ambitious man, not the reality of an ambitious man. Because the reality is he's out and about, he's doing things, he may not be always super available to you. And, and listen, there's nothing wrong with you as a woman if you don't like that. There's nothing wrong. Like, I think people have demonized the word clingy, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we need to start looking at it differently because there are some women who like that man to be close to them constantly. They like to be in the man's skin damn near, okay? Like, <laughs> that, that's just who they are. And granted, sometimes it does come from a very unhealthy place. But some people really value that deeper bond and being close to each other. And if you know being with that achieving entrepreneurial man, whatever, is going to leave you feeling unsettled and not at peace, don't be with that guy. Be with the guy who can pour into you in that way because there are men who are just like you, who want that constant level of closeness. Whereas there are other women who may be, let's just say, more free-spirited, more like, hey, I want quality time with my man, but I don't need him all the time there because I can go do my own thing. I got my friends. I have my other things going on. And she, that woman is more better suited for that kind of man. That's how we should be trying to navigate this whole dating process. So I definitely think we just have to be real with ourselves, know who we are, and stand in that because anything else is only going to undermine our ability to find and experience a healthy relationship. Mm, because we're always going to constantly either, like try and change each other. So yes. going to your analogy of, let's say, the clingy, which I like, let's let's reframe that. Clingy is a good thing. <laughs> it's someone that wants to be close to somebody. So the, you've got someone who's clingy and then you've got the really ambitious person. Okay, mm -hmm. for them to be together, one of them needs to change or neither of them get their needs met. Exactly. So, so I guess those are the options, right? Neither of them get their needs met because the ambitious person wants that space, but then the person's always being clingy with them and the clingy person just wants them to be close and they're not. So if one person moves closer to the other person, they're now giving up what they value. So it's either the ambitious person is now giving up the part of their ambition or the clingy person's actually given up the, the need or the want to have somebody close to them. Yes, exactly. And it's just, it's just going to create conflict. And, and I think this is what happens to so many people. And they're not being honest about that. And again, because they've demonized or allow society to demonize what their specific needs are. So that person who is quote unquote mm. clingy is being told this is bad, 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 bad. And again, some situations it it is coming from an unhealthy place. But in a lot of people, that's just who they are. And if she's not accepting or he not accepting that part of themselves because they're worried about everyone else saying it's, it's not healthy, now they, they go into constant denial of this. And now they're never having this need satisfied. Same thing with the ambitious person who's being told, oh, you're too, you're doing too much. No, that's just who I am. Like, <laughs> you can't tell me it's too much. Like, I'm someone who will never retire. I believe in mm. always working, you know? 
And I always say I would need a woman who respects and honors my ambition. I don't need her to be ambitious too in that sense. I need her to honor and respect mine. And if that's the case, and she can't have her own ambitions, but there has to be a harmony and a complementing of each other. But too many people are conflicting with each other. And then, and then they'll say, well, you know, I can't let this person go for that reason because they're a good person. Yeah, but you're not happy. And, and, it's, and it's those, those unresolved issues that then lead to infidelity that people don't want to accept and realize. A lot of infidelity stemmed from voids in the relationship. You know, people will say, oh, you can give a man everything and he'll still cheat. I have to say 90 something percent of cases is not the man getting everything and he cheated. Plain and simple. And that's not to make the cheating man okay. Same thing for the women who've cheated, all right? Which is funny because most women will acknowledge that if the woman cheated, something was missing at home. <laughs> but, but if the man cheated, he must have had everything and still cheated. <laughs> I hate to say it, but I think you're right. I think you're right. Oh God, that's never dawned on me. I'll tell you. But it's reality is both of them have... they Because here's what happens on on... Not to dwell too much on it, but... When a woman, a lot of times when a woman or even a man says, I gave them everything, what they mean is I gave them everything that I deemed necessary and acceptable. I did what I thought should be enough, but you weren't really doing what they wanted. All right. So it's almost like to get even more specific, it's almost like someone who says, well, I, I gave them sex whenever they wanted. Yeah. But the things they wanted sexually in the bedroom to be done, you never did. You just, yeah, you showed up physically, but you didn't do it. It's the same way if a man says, well, I, I, I'm home with her. No, you're in your room while she's in the other room. So yeah, you were home, but you were not present with her. So she still felt the void. You see what I'm saying? So you didn't give her everything. You just gave her what you felt was enough or what you wanted to do. That's not acceptable if we want to make sure we're fortifying our relationships, and fulfilling our partner's needs and desires. And this is why, again, we got to, it, it kind of goes back to that discussion about discussing standards and going deeper. We got to go deeper and even get more specific about what it is I need from my partner. It can't just be, well, I need quality time. What does quality time look like? It can't just be, I just need sex three times a week. No, what does that look like? Because again, the type of sex makes a huge difference. All right. It can't just be, oh, well, uh, I want some kids. No, no, be real, because some of y'all want three, four. He wants one and we have a disconnect. We can't just say, oh, do you want kids? Yes. OK, we're on the same page. No, we're not. No, we're not. Because if his one and you want four, that in itself can become a huge argument. And now there's resentment and regret because they weren't even on the same page as, as far as how big they wanted their family to be. We got to get deeper with each other and get more specific if we want to make sure we are truly in alignment with each other. You know, I love that so much. And it reminded me of a conversation. So me and Tom practiced that at one point. And he was asking me, he's like, play, come and play video games with me. And he just kept like asking, asking and asking. And he's like, you know, it'd be so, instead of just asking, right? Like, hey, do you want to play video games? And I kept saying no. He's like, <laughs> it, would, it would be really meaningful to me if you played video games with me. Okay, so now he's telling me how, it, how he feels about me playing video games. That was mm. very helpful. And then the second part was um, kind of, you know, I think relationships are, not, are always, that you need to reciprocate. And so mm. he was like, and what do you want in return? Right, like I realize that you don't want to do this. I realize you're doing it for me. So what do you want in return? So I was like, okay, let me think, what do I want? Like almost like rewards, right? Yeah. What's the reward? And so I was like, I want you, the next time we come shopping, or the next time I want to go shopping, I want you to come with me, but I want you to be happy about it. <laughs> and that's the key, Stefan, because I said, often bless you, but you just sit there looking miserable, like I'm like pulling your eyes out of your socket. Mm -hmm. And he's like, cool, as long as you look happy about playing video games. So I was like, sure, because sometimes we get in that pattern of trying to show up for the other person and not actually being there in order to make them feel good about it. Yeah. It's more like a resistance. So it's like, God, oh, you're making me play video games. See, I told you I would die. Right now my frustration, <laughs> right, like if we're playing the shooting game, now my frustration comes across and he's not actually getting what he wants. And now you're just like, well, you may as well not be here then. And yeah. then sometimes you trying to show up to help that person ends up being an annoyance and now no one gets what they want. Absolutely. But you know what? what's awesome about your story, and I, and I hope people implement this, is the reward system. Mm -hmm. Because 
It's so much easier to be happy doing something I never really cared for when I know I'm getting a reward out of it. Yeah. And some people have this, well, why should we be rewarding each other? Why not? If that's going to be part of the motivation that helps us pour into each other, why not? Because again, you even using the shopping example, could you imagine if men across the world were told, hey, if you go shopping with me and you look happy, I'm going to do that thing you like in the bedroom. He'd be like, let's go. <laughs> that's another agreement Tom and I had, but I thought I'd use the video game example. <laughs> he'd, be like, he'd be like, what? Shop, let's go everywhere. Where you want to go next? <laughs> Throw the wallet at you for all you kids. Because he knows, okay, I, I'm, it's a mutually beneficial thing. And I think that's what's important is that a lot of times we're asking for things out of our partner, but we're not asking how we can then return that favor to them, so to speak. And when we can create that, it creates a lot of harmony. And, and again, it turns into genuine happiness, not even just a fake happiness. No, I'm genuinely happy because I know I don't want some points for what I want to get to. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to feed it. And then, and then what's crazy is, we do it enough times, and now, even despite the outcome of what I'm going to get in return, we may learn to enjoy each other more in that moment. Like, you may learn to enjoy a little bit more about the video game. He may enjoy a little bit more about the shopping because you guys had more time to bond in a positive setting or positive mindset because of that whole reward system that you guys implemented. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And I told him, babe, you can also, like, choose some clothes that you may want to see me in. So that was like the little the added bonus there. There you go, you yeah. see? Oh, God. Stefan, this has been so freaking enjoyable. Um, where can people find you and all the incredible work you're putting out? Yes, they can find me, Stefan Speaks, on YouTube, uh, StefanSpeaks.com, everywhere Stefan Speaks. If you want to become a woman that every single person respects, then keep watching. I said I ran into a relationship that I knew I was I didn't deserve. And um, in the process of that, it was definitely verbal abuse. It was emotional abuse. Uh, I mean, my mother didn't like the person, so <laughs> I couldn't, I didn't know where to run to. Oh. Uh, they, it was a mutual thing of like, oh, well, you don't like her? Well, I'm gonna, I like that she's here because now I can torture you. Like, I'm tor tormenting my mom from the other side. She's like, you need to leave. You don't need to be in that relationship. So I think my family having a huge uh, say in any relationship that I was in kind of affected how I saw the person. I just felt like, oh my gosh, leave them alone. Like, it's okay. This person's broken and they need my help or they need me. Maybe this is one of my missions that they need my help to help them fix them. Uh, maybe he didn't see himself broken, but he was broken. And I, I was attracted to that. I'm, I'm attracted to fixing things. And uh, in the middle of trying to fix something, you also cut yourself in the midst of that and you don't recognize it, but you do realize in the process of that, you become a different woman. You start crumbling, you start losing layers of what makes you a strong woman, what makes you a powerful woman, a boss. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was okay with, uh, like I said, dimming my light or pulling back layers that made me feel very dominant uh, and allowed him to be the dominant. So red flag. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it was just the way we carried his, carried ourselves. Uh, the support was sometimes there, but I think I want to say there was a mistake. I don't want to say it out loud. There was a mistake that I made. And I felt like because I made that big mistake within our relationship, that was something I deserved. That was God. God, um, that was God punishing me for the incident that had happened between us. So I felt like, oh my gosh, this is what I deserve. And this is my curse. Yep. Yep. Uh, those were not, that wasn't God. And that was my inner demons. That was not him at all because God would have said, you don't deserve this still. You need to walk away and get up and leave. There's much better out there. You need to heal. You need to be on your own. I wasn't listening to those voices. I was listening to the other side. And uh, I stayed. I stayed. I stayed. I stayed. No matter how many times I was either being cheated on or verbally abused or uh, being accused many multiple times, uh, multiple times, I felt like, no, 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 I need to stay. Like, this is what I get, whatever. And uh, finally I got exhausted. I got tired of crying. I got tired of crying. I got tired of the, ma the manipulation. Um, it was kind of uh, narcissistic, if that makes sense. Uh, he was that to me. I just felt like I couldn't get out of it. Um, and I will, I will say like, this wasn't the only ship relationship that kind of crippled me. There was many others before this that kind of kept me still staying the same girl, uh, caring to a man, being 
a wifey material. I mean, I naturally have that to me. Being the oldest daughter, I'm a provider and I love being that image to my siblings where I'm like, oh no, I got it. I'll take care of you guys. Being that I can take care of you. Energy is what I carried within my relationships mm. in my journey. So being like a mom to these men was so wrong, that, that trait. Mm. Uh, I didn't know how to allow a man to take care of me. I didn't know how to accept that. I mean, sometimes it was uh, brought upon my journey where there was a man that wanted to be that for me, but I didn't know how to say yes. Oh yeah, do it. I was okay with being the provider and being, no, I do that. You don't need to buy me nothing. You know, sometimes it's cool being a, a dominant boss mm -hmm. woman and everything. Yeah, I got my own money. I got my own this. You don't need to do nothing. Oh no, I give gifts. But this man started sending me gifts. And I was like, uh -huh. This is new. You know what? That's what I need. That's I'm I'm always the one that's giving. I need to learn how to let it how to receive it. Um, and the last one I was in, he didn't understand how to do that for me. Emotionally, he was there because he understood I was running away from work and my mother, but not understanding that he needed to also value me within that. He didn't know how to balance that. Uh, so Eventually, I like I said, I got exhausted. I got tired of crying. And I said, as a woman, I mean, I said, I'm going to get even. That's how I handled that. Really? Okay, I'm going to be real. Please I said, there. I'm going to get even. Okay. I'm tired of crying. No more crying. Yeah. How do you make this man feel like you? Put him in your shoes through the emotional damage that you're suffering with. Okay. And I said, no more crying. Make him cry. Mm. Make him understand. Be a mirror of him. So I started carrying myself like him just to show him, like, this is what you do to me. You cry sometimes. And I'll be like, doesn't feel good, right? No. So stop. Don't Th do that to that me. Because you were taking even, your power back. Mm, yeah. That was me standing up. That was like a first step. Mm. Then going around people, going around uh, a massive crowd, uh, they would see me and I didn't realize how beautiful I was. I mean, I was used to someone telling me, not even complimenting me. I would, my homegirls would compliment me. I would rarely get any compliments from him. So uh, I found my power when I was outside. And I said, this is when you, you don't like eyes on me. The eyes will instantly come on me once I walk out and show my confidence and show my beauty and embrace it and believe it. Mm -hmm. Key word, mm -hmm. believe it. So once I, that was my get even, another part two. Getting even when I'm outside in public and like, okay, people are saying, like, oh my gosh, what are you doing out here with this person? Like, you're too good for them. And I was like, oh my gosh, I would still be nice about it. Take it lightly. Uh, that was also something that I was like, aha, aha moment. Mm -hmm. There it is. Get home. Oh, he didn't like the attention I was getting or whatever. So part two, that was two. Number three was leaving. What led to me leaving was me getting back into this. I found music again. I said, you know what? Since I can't rent anything else, since I feel like I'm not safe with family, safe with this relationship, I think I still probably have a chance with this music and I could probably just start it again. I mean, I was still getting loved by my fans and people that recognize me in these like dingy places. Like I'm going to these little underground clubs and restaurants and I'm traveling at places and I'm still thinking no one recognizes me. Once I get to these places, people are like, oh my gosh, it's Dinah J. They recognize me and I'm over here in a hoodie or I'm like having my hair all pulled back and I'm thinking people forgot about me. I thought people forgot about me. They don't remember Dinah Jane. And just being recognized in those little moments, in those little places, it kind of woke me up. Like, what are you doing? You have so much on your plate to do. You have so much power. There's a platform still that you can access easily with a snap of a finger and you're back out there and voila, look at everyone. They need you. So I would have these moments to myself and listen to my music and the ones that are unreleased. And it kind of woke me up and said, girl, what are you doing? Get up, get up. I found my, my strength again. I found my passion for music again. And that's where I found the strength to walk away from everything that didn't, that wasn't serving me right anymore. So once you find your power, once you find yourself of what makes me happy, 
that's when things that don't matter start fading away and at its own time. But um, I think going through that turbulent time, it was also God speaking to me like, oh, well, look at this. You gained so much wisdom. Like I said, I would not be sitting here right now with you if I did not have the courage to like, if it was three years ago, I would not be talking to you like this. Like I would just give you the cookie cutter stuff and be like, oh yeah, let's put on the face and tell you what I have planned out and da 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 da. But to be sitting here now on a couch with you and speaking of my story, I'm very proud of myself. I am so proud of myself to even have the courage to speak, courage to stand up and voice my story. Um, I lost a couple people on this journey, but then I gained them back in a different lens where we respect each other and love each other wholeheartedly in a different light where we're like, I love this new us. We needed to go through that time so we can find ourselves and understand that this is a new time and that those times were were bad habits, things that we needed to erase, learn and unlearn things. Um, like I said, growing up Polynesian, as a Polynesian woman, being in a household of many people, uh, I was used to muting myself or not being loud or not voicing my opinion. I had other people louder than me, so I'll just go with the flow. Yeah. But now it's it's different. It's a different air in my household where we truly love each other and they respect my decisions and they love seeing the woman that I've become. And uh, there were a few attempts where my family wanted to do a family meeting. And in those meetings, uh, there was a lot of tears that were shed, a lot of I'm sorry's, a lot of things that I wanted to hear from my parents of saying, I'm sorry, owning up to things that they know that hurt me. Me exchanging that verbiage of saying, I'm sorry. The key one that I wanted to hear the most was, I just want to be your mom. I remember it like yesterday. Like, no, I'm running away from my mom. I'm running away. And um, I got a phone call. I, I actually call her and I say, mom, there's some business stuff happening right now. And she's like, stop it. Don't even continue. She was like, where are you? I want you to come home, come home. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I just want my daughter back. I love you. Just come home to me. I'm, whatever it is, I, Dinah, I don't, I, I don't, I'll let go of it. I don't want to hold you too tight no more. I'm sorry. I, I, I saw, I saw things different uh, and I shouldn't have. And that's what pushed me away from you. And I'm so sorry. Please come home. Stop running from me. Stop running from me. And um, I just want to be your mom was what, made this relationship so much stronger and um, made the little girl in me say, thank you, mom, for finally seeing the situation the way it should be seen. Uh, she was just so good at being a momager. I mean, she was so good at it. Much of my success goes to her because she made me the woman I am. But uh, just hearing that as from a parent's perspective and a daughter's perspective, we're still learning. My mom's young, so she's 44, 45, and um, she's learning, I'm learning, and it's just all about communication. Uh, I'm glad that we went through that time where she she opened up her eyes, I opened up mine. You know, sometimes we can be very stubborn and very prideful, like, no, this is the way it goes, you know? And for her to finally accept that, I could not, wait to race home and hug her and kiss her and tell her I love you. Because in those dark moments, even though I was in this relationship I didn't deserve, I knew that one day I was going to run to her and tell her, mom, you were right. And I didn't want to tell her those things <laughs> because of my pride. Yeah. I was like, no, mom, I'm good. Like, I got this. I, I, I deserve this, mom. But going back to her and telling her, like, I love you so much. And I never uttered the words, I hate you because you're my blood, you're my mother. I will never utter those words, I hate my mother, because you brought me into this life. You made me this strong woman that I am. You've given, you've guided me through this time of like self-discovery and finding myself uh, before I turned 23. And then 23 and on is when I was on it by myself, trying to figure out who Dinah is. I mean, I delayed those times, many times. I kind of delayed my entrance back into the industry because I felt like I wasn't ready. I felt like I didn't even have the right team at the time. I just felt like no one understood me or were hearing me. So that took time to cultivate a, a team on your own. And um, they were handpicked. I selected people from back at home who were also Polynesian. And uh, 
why not go backwards and go to people who are, you know, go connect to your roots. Uh, you're in an industry where it's very filtered and there's, I just felt like I was becoming like many other pop girls, like, which isn't bad. Like, yes, homage to them. Mm -hmm. I love that for them. But I wanted to be different and be true to myself and bring my culture to the forefront. My music has so much, so many stories. Like I'm speaking of my grandmother, of how she prayed for this moment where I would be the superstar. My grandma was like, during my break, she kept telling me, when are you gonna get back to work? <laughs> when are you gonna sing again? I'm waiting, I'm how waiting. How did you feel She's about my that pressure? Uh, I told her grandma, I don't wanna do it. Like, she didn't understand that. Uh, the pressure was there, but I just told them, no, in my own time, I will get up and do, and do it. So uh, the pressure was really difficult to kind of, hold together. But I, I will say, I, I think I did a pretty good job for coming this far and learning a lot about myself and the people I surround myself with. Um, I'm surrounding myself now with winners, people who love to win, people who want to win, who have that drive and hunger of making a name for themselves or having something to stand for. I stand for my people. Mm. I stand for Polynesians. So I just did a video where I had thick, luscious, looking Tahitian hair, mm -hmm. where it was untamed. I'm always used to my hair being like, well put together. She wants to be on sometimes. <laughs> but I told the hairstylist, I was like, no, I don't want her to brush her out, comb her out. That's how Polynesian dancers look mm -hmm. when they have their hair done. It's combed out, long, luscious, thick. And I do have that naturally. I have thick Polynesian hair. So within my image, I'm also trying to embrace that. Loving my curls, loving my color, loving my story, loving just being a curvy Polynesian woman. It's so unique and refreshing to bring this to my lifestyle in the music industry. Mm -hmm. Dude, <laughs> thank you. So that was so freaking beautiful. And I felt like I was on like a whole like roller coaster ride with you as you were breaking that down. And what really stuck out to me in everything that you were saying, because I'm going to go back to everyone falls. Everybody falls. The problem is not everyone gets back up. Mm -hmm. And when you were metaphorically on your knees in this toxic relationship, you didn't have your family to turn to, or you felt like you, you know, had run away from them. Um, you also had your culture, which I know that um, you had said, I believe I pushed God away from me because I wanted to fall. Mm -hmm. And so you seem like you really were just trying to let go of everything, suffering in this silence with this ex, um, who's now your ex. And now in this whole transition that you just took me through, what I started to hear was you started to build your confidence. Mm -hmm. And even though you made him cry, it was you taking your power back. Mm -hmm. And as you take your power back, one step at a time, it becomes the stacking bricks that then allows you to build your house that you live in now. Yes. And Amen. that's the one thing like I always think about is that to be able to leave that, to then be able to go to your mom and say this didn't work, and then to be able to create the space and create the boundaries so that you and your mom could have this dynamic, have this open conversation, end up hearing what you want to hear. Because not everyone ends up hearing what they actually want to hear, right? Yeah. But the fact that you did is just another thing that was so beautiful. But I don't think it would have happened if you hadn't have built your confidence, mm -hmm. if you hadn't have spoken up, if you hadn't have put in boundaries with your family of saying, no, I don't want to do this anymore. And so while that heartbreak is that you fell, it almost became the catalyst that you needed to then build yourself back up again. It's like a rebirth. Yeah. Like the um, phoenix. Yes. Yes. That is a great example. So I came across this quote. And it said, for a star to be born, there is one thing that must happen. A gaseous nebula must collapse. So collapse. Crumble. This is not your destruction. This is your birth. Oh, she just gave me fucking chills. I mean, that very much applies to everything you very were saying. Very much. Very much applies to me. Uh, and I feel that rebirth. Like, yes, I did have to, I had to fall. And I wanted to fall. It's different if, mm -hmm. like, you just fail because you couldn't keep up. But this, <laughs> this fall was because I wanted to fall. I wanted to feel what rock bottom felt like. I, I mean... 
at, at this time too, in this very turbulent time, I felt like I wasn't doing enough. I mean, even before that, when I was living life to the fullest with the girls and, you know, traveling everywhere, winning, going to every award show, I just always felt like I wasn't doing enough for anyone back at home. Uh, because some people back at home who I thought had were my biggest supporters, not my media family, but others within my family, uh, they didn't really believe in me. They were waiting for me to fall. They, they were so happy that I fell. They wanted their niece to fall. They wanted their, this girl that they raised to, to crumble because they didn't like seeing her win. I compared myself a lot to women, other women. I didn't like making many friends. I liked having my two friends and that was it, who have been my friends since like my childhood. But uh, breaking out of that habit, I just saw women as competition because of this relationship. And then I was like, this is so backwards. Mm -hmm. I am definitely a girl's girl. I am so a girl's girl. And how is it that you're over here comparing yourself to another beautiful woman? This is not right. You're in the wrong place. This, this person doesn't love you. With the girls, I always found myself constantly comparing myself. It was just always in everything I was doing, I was not enough. Or you need to be like that person. Or how can you be like that girl to get attention? Um, he's looking at her, so look like her. Like, carry yourself that way. It's competition everywhere you go. I think it's, it comes back to the confidence part, though, mm -hmm. right? Is that if that happens, when you don't have the confidence, it breaks you. If you yeah. see a beautiful person, that's going back to your family, yeah. right? Like, when someone wants to see you fall, in my head, I just think it's a reflection of how they feel about themselves. Insecurities. The, exactly. Is that your success mirrors the fact that they're not successful. Right. And so when you're not confident, it breaks you. When you're confident, you can see another beautiful woman go, oh my God, look at her boobs. Like, they're great. Yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> sorry, you thought to stare at your boobs. <laughs> but like, oh, you. you got some good jugs there right there. Um, Thank you. But like, you can look and go, I admire that yes. versus it makes me insecure about how I feel about myself. And that all comes back to your own worth. You even said it, right? Mm -hmm. Like I now know my worth. Yeah. And I think that, that it goes so freaking hand in hand. Yeah. Amen to that. I mean, even just in this time of truly loving myself, accepting my figure was so hard for me. I mean, I was in denial that I was going a couple sizes up from what I was used to uh, because I was so, uh, I was depressed and running through, running away from everyone and wanting to be on my own. I noticed my figure was changing. So that caught up to me because of my emotions. Mm -hmm. So the emotions, the physicality was like, girl, something's wrong. <laughs> I mean, I almost didn't come back again too, like in the industry because I'm thick. I'm a thicker girl now. I was like, I don't know, I'm a little insecure, like da da da. But no, I noticed that that's where my beauty is, and that's where my power is, is embracing my journey. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like celebrities, we live in like this yearbook thing where people like compare mm -hmm. our lifestyle. They're like, oh my gosh, this person back in 2014 and now, like, look at the way they're at now. And I've always had that pressure, but I love that I don't have to use that anymore. I've I've shut that that part of me off where it is a journey and I want people I, I I want people to accept that that I love me for me whatever it is whatever I'm giving whatever era I'm in mm. so what happens if I assume or maybe I'm not maybe I'm incorrect I don't ever think that that always goes away that every so often that voice tries to seep into your consciousness and yes. um, what do you do in those moments then when you start to feel that negative idea or voice in your head start to try and tell you otherwise? I do my best to turn turn it off by like, just lying to myself. Girl, you're beautiful, you look amazing. Lying Even yourself, if you don't to, feel to, it. To, to push that down mm -hmm. because that morning I felt gorgeous. Mm -hmm. But then when I walk out later throughout the day, it's wearing off, my, my confidence mm -hmm. starts wearing off. Like, oh my gosh, because of one little thing that didn't sit right with me, it kind of ruined the rest of my day. Um, so I try to remember like how I woke up that morning. Okay, how did you feel that morning? Come back to it. What, what what does it take to go back to that? Listening to a song that could probably bring my, my confidence back to get through these press days or make sure I feel great about myself regardless. Um, and just, yeah, I think that there's power in that, like playing a song or reverting back to that morning of how you woke up, that confidence that you woke up with. Yeah, I Find love her that. Again. Music is so freaking powerful oh to my do gosh. that. Like, honestly, I've just been listening to your music nonstop, knowing <laughs> that you were going to come on this show. And it was just like, it's so, it really does like, 
um, pattern interrupt mm -hmm. what you might be having right in that moment of the negative thoughts coming in. Because I don't ever think of myself as how do I get to perfect? How do I get to permanently shut off that that voice in my head? I've tried for 44 years. It hasn't That's happened never going yet. To, yeah. Exactly. So as I say, you just got to lie to yourself. So yeah, like... yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but hey, <laughs> if, if that works, why not, right? Yes. I'm so all about the tactics and tools that we can use in those moments. Mm -hmm. It's so freaking important for us to then get back to the person we want to be. And I heard recently a definition of integrity. Mm -hmm. And it was when you're the voice in your head, the words coming out of your mouth and your actions all align. Amen to that, I believe in that. So I was like, that is really powerful way yes. of thinking. Am I living in integrity? Am I like, because yes. I love having like a North Star, like when those moments happen, revert back to mm -hmm. your North Star. Mm -hmm. So that like a uh, definition of integrity really hit me because I was like, oh, okay, how do I, if I have to lie to myself, at least that's the voice in my head, yeah. right? So yeah. it's like, you're beautiful. Okay, what do I say Stay to myself when I walk past the mirror? <laughs> yeah, because the amount of times I didn't even realize like bad habits that are so ingrained in you, they don't even realize you're doing the amount of times I would just walk past a mirror without even realizing and insult myself and it wasn't until I had a guest on the show it's like a psychologist and she's like just take inventory so I was like okay just for a week and I was like oh my god I'm a bully in my own head right you are your own monster yeah uh I mean I think that's a just a trait that us women have probably I mean like I said, we're not feeling enough or feeling beautiful enough or being the ideal beauty mm -hmm. in a public eye. Um, I think that's something that we can always be always a voice that we always have in the back of our head. But the truth in it is to build your confidence and keep that beauty alive is just. I think for me, it's music. It really is what I create. Mm. Um, I know that's where my power is. Or even finding, coming across quotes just as this as I found. Like that kind of boosted my, my confidence just now. It woke me up like, girl, you're in the right place at the right time. Or even speaking to God. Mm. During those times when I push God away, uh, I now, I mean, being a Latter-day Saint, a church member, um, there's like a certain way to pray. It's like, dear Heavenly Father, and then you thank Him for everything. Then you say what you want. Then you say Amen. But then I found my own type of piece of talking to God, singing to him. Like there was a time I was driving in a car and I was like in like in no man's land by myself with no gas. And I'm like, oh my gosh, where's the next station? Like if I don't find this next oh, station, God. I am going to end up on this road by myself asking for help in the middle of nowhere in a desert oh, God. by myself. Who is going to help me? And I'm just driving. I'm like, please, God, if you can get me here. I'm just like having fun with it and just talking to God. And what do you know? I got there right on time when it hit. Oh, you only have two miles left. OK, so God got me through those moments right. and just finding how to communicate to him and helping having his help and finding my voice and beauty again or just having that assurance that you're OK. You're more than OK. Get out of your head. Get out of your head. So, well, your music is just fantastic. I actually wrote down some of your lyrics on okay. one of your songs. Um, heard it all before because I, yes. thought, I was like, this is a song I needed when I was younger okay. and in a relationship <laughs> where I kept going back to the guy oh. who was emotionally abusive to me. And um, the song's so good, I was like, I don't know what lyrics to pull. Like the whole freaking song is great. But I just Thank pulled you. some. Said you care for me, care for me, but you wasn't there for me, there for me. Now you're trying to beg for me, beg for me, but it's too late for sorries. No ifs, ands, or buts. And if you want. On a second chance, I doubt it. Don't waste your breath. I'm out of here scouting. Yeah, you the reason that I'm Audi. Cause I heard it all before. Can't live without me. Yeah, I heard it all before. Go, you you're all I need. Boy, I heard it all before. Little bitch. <laughs> Little bitch. Yeah. That's how I end it. <laughs> Cause I heard it all before. Can live without me. Yeah, I heard it all before. Girl, you all I need. Boy, I heard it all before. Save your energy for the next bitch. Cause she just ain't me. I like You could rap that. Oh my god. If I wasn't married, I would propose to you right oh now. My like <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> my, my rendition was not very great. Um but there's nice. so much power in words. Mm -hmm. There's so much power in music. And so even you saying you singing to God, 
Like it made me think about <laughs> A, how you're building that power within yourself. Mm-hmm. B, it's your own creative outlet. And then C, it's speaking to someone that you very much look up to as helping you be powerful. Yes. And so- As when, therapy. Yeah. Literally, anything, anytime I walk into the studio, I feel like I always want to make, create music of something that relates to me or something I'm going through. So I always kept a journal beside me and I was like, okay, what do I feel like talking about? Oh, I forgot that happened to me. I'm really good at burying my emotions and not bringing them back to life. So I heard it all before. It was one of those where I was like, I want to talk about this one relationship where I wasted three years on this man that I did not deserve. And uh, it's therapy, not only for me, but I noticed for the listeners that they also relate to it. Maybe that's why it's so powerful. I mean, I've heard so many times that I heard it all before is a lot of people's favorite song, men or women. Mm. Um, and it's, like I said, like, yeah, it is powerful. So knowing my power, I'm taking that with me and not taking it so lightly that there's messages to carry within your music. Um, and now I have that power because I'm doing this independently. So I love- there are no, there are no wrongs. There is no wrong, there are no mistakes I can make. There's no pressure. You could just literally be unabashedly yourself. And if you fall, you fall, girl, you know how to get back up again. I'm not gonna cry about it. I've already been there. Not crying about it. Get back up and what can I do next? I think that's so, so powerful, especially from where we started this interview where you yeah. were saying about, you know, you were 15 and you had no power and you were just listening to everybody. To be able to hear you say that is so freaking amazing. Thank you. I really want everyone to like let that sink in that even if they don't believe it's possible it freaking is oh, and you've definitely. been just such an example of that um and then going back to your craft like i think a lot of us don't necessarily even identify what that was because that was like metaphorically being an hour of us when we was like why are you wasting time with that so coming from a greek family yeah. um i love to draw and my dad was just like are you going to be a doctor are you going to be a lawyer up until we get married of course and then he wants me to retire and just have kids yes <laughs> but it was like what are you going to do in the meantime and so the, the idea of drawing or singing mm-hmm. or dancing or some form of expression, we don't necessarily lean into much. Um, and so urging people to just start that again, mm-hmm. I think it can be really beautiful. And knowing that that was a part of your journey and healing is yeah. so empowering. And then you Thank actually you. said that you journal. Do you still journal? I did. I started it up again. That's, oh, so you stopped. I started it up again. I stopped. When I stopped doing music, I also stopped journaling. Oh, wow. And if I did journal, it would be like two days of the year. That I would like, okay, so this is what happened today, or like this is what I'm feeling. Uh, and but then I'm also really good at taking pictures and taking videos. I'm love living in the moment, but also capturing it. So that's kind of like my journal. And I'm like, oh, that's where I was a year ago, or that's where I was that happened a few months ago. Um, I feel like I feel healed, but I'm still healing from certain things. I'd actually love to jump in and ask you mm-hmm. a question. So you're saying about your journaling. Why is it that when we fall? that's the time we stop doing the things that we actually need. What do you think is happening in those moments where we retreat so much that we stop doing the things that probably need to get out? Uh, I mean, it was eating. (laughs) I love food. So (laughs) is it like then um, pushing back your emotions? Like I don't actually want to address them. Mm -hmm. I don't even want to see them. I don't want to think them, let alone see them and write them. So let me distract myself with food. Yeah, let me distract myself with food or just be outside and just, I mean, drinking was probably not the smart thing to do was, you know, that's what I, how I handled my emotions. Um, just lashing out and just going out and getting drunk and faded. And I felt like that was one way of handling it. Um, and yeah, it probably wasn't the best thing to do, but uh, journaling was like a huge thing that I used to do. I used to love updating my journal, like little things. I mean, I still have the journal where I drew a VMA, uh, an, a VMA oh. award in my journal. I was like, one day I want to get a VMA awards. And it happened in 2016. Oh so God. the power of manifestation and just, you know, even just doodling those times or uh, expressing yourself during those times. And I love journaling. I love getting in there and updating myself and saying like, okay, so this happened or mentioning interviews that I've had or uh, people that made my day or something that I saw. Like I came across uh, someone in need off of the street and giving them just something like acknowledging those little things. Maybe my kids would love to hear those things one day. Kids, that's not gonna happen for a while, but. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, actually, I'm just curious to ask, what is now on your vision board? So you've already got the VMA. Who needs that anymore? Or maybe you want another one. But what is that now that you feel like you're working towards? And how powerful do you think that is to envision what your future looks like? I think um, sustaining that, oh, she's the first Polynesian in this and that, uh, mm. having my own lane. I have so much that I want to build. And um, I'm building a, a label yeah, for yeah. not only myself, but for my for the next generation. I want to open up those doors for the kids who have dreams. Um, and I want their parents to believe that this is possible. For a girl like me from this little city, Santa Ana, California, and from her families are from, from Tonga or from the Pacific Islands. If she could dream this big and make it happen, it can happen for any other Polynesian kid. We're just so talented. Um, and I just want to bring that to life more, not only in sports, but in the music field. Um, I've always felt like I was kind of running this alone as, in the mainstream world for a pop Polynesian girl. And uh, I just hope to only keep inspiring them and open doors for me, for them in my career. Mm. Um, I just want to release music that still speaks to me. They feel so timeless to me that I know that it will definitely impact someone else and get them through their journey. Uh, there's just so many chapters of my life that I'm embracing within my music. Um, and I just want to build businesses. I don't only want to, I know music isn't my only thing. It's not my only niche. There's so much more to me. I love being a businesswoman. I want to own my own things. I want to own my own businesses and run things and be a part of everything. I want to be a part of the process and just build, build, build. And whatever, whatever that takes, I will do it. So, um, except I, for lowering your self worth and dimming your light. Lower, mm, girl, <laughs> yes. Say that again. <laughs> Retweet. <laughs> I mean, there's just so much that I want to do, like maybe even still to win a Grammy one of these days and still be a part of history with the greats, the greatest of the greats. And um, just and also release music, still continue to release music that speaks to me, that is real and authentic. I love that. And then being the example, because there's a young you out there right mm -hmm. now, not feeling like she's worthy, not feeling like she's got a voice, not feeling like she can speak up. And... It is very I mean, hard. it was also my sister. I have a younger sister, so I felt like I saw a piece of myself in her. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I need to break this habit that's going on in our household so that it doesn't affect her. I didn't want it to um, cripple her. May it only cripple me. Being the oldest, you know, we're breaking these generational mm -hmm. curses. But um, I'm in that place now where she understands that like, now she has the freedom now to just be unabashedly herself. Um, and say out loud what her dreams are and aspirations are and nothing's wrong. So I love this place that I'm at. Like I said, like you said, uh, there's another girl, a little younger girl version of me out there somewhere. And I just hope through me speaking about my journey that it definitely not only helps her, but helps the women in her life who are her leaders right now, that they understand her in a different lens, their daughter through a different lens. Yeah, so Girl, this has been such a freaking pleasure to talk yes. to you. Where can people find you and all the amazing music that you're doing and like following up on? Because we're all going to be tracking now that we, you know, you yes. said what you're, you're going to be up to. So um, you can just find me anywhere. It's Dinah Jane, D-I-N-A-H-J-A-N-E uh, on all platforms. I'm not that hard to find. To learn the love lessons that you wish you knew sooner, click here right now. So right now you are single. And you say yeah. you're on the dating streets, if you will. <laughs> and you said in order to be hilarious, a great data, yeah. you need to be.